Hello, hello, what's going on everybody? Welcome in to another live stream. My name is Eve Robinson and I teach ZBrush at Maxon. I'm the full-time uh, lead ZBrush trainer and training manager. And so it's awesome to be back for a second stream of the year. What's going on? I see film, hello. It says, uh, hello teacher, it seems to be late, but happy new year because of your live streams. I could have spent fun time uh, learning a 3D model on 2023. Thank you, thank you very much. You are so welcome. What's up, Travis? What's up, IC? What's up, Skyzill? What's up, I Stranger? What's up, Tufan? What's up, Amir? How you guys doing? Welcome in, everyone. Okay, so recap last week. Um, I absolutely did not do anything to this model. I didn't have time. So uh, what's up, Ben? What's up, Lord? Uh, I didn't have time to do anything to this model whatsoever. So we're literally starting from right where we left off. And like a good artist, um, there's a lot of things I don't like and things that we want to do in order to improve upon it, uh, finish some of the block out elements, and then start maybe getting into uh, some a little bit more um, uh, secondary stuff. Try to move into that range. There's also like a little controller thing I want to give him. I want him to hold something, which I think is pretty cool. So just like anything, we only did a couple hours on this. So first pass. It's looking pretty cool, but we can do something a little bit more than that. But always, always the thing that I stress the most is that when you start a new project, no matter what character is or what's going on, the biggest thing to remember is that you're always going to kind of uh, self-analyze, self-critique it, and you may not like it for a little bit. So if you're new to this, that feeling is normal. It's very normal, very common. So looking at this, it's all about just recognizing the things we want to improve and then moving forward. So that being said, we're looking at a good character turn. And yeah, well, he needs a few things. He needs a tongue. He needs a little bit more uh, structure in his body a bit. The hard surface thing he's sitting on is, eh, it's just a blackout. So yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm super excited. Leonard, what's happening? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, beanie's off because I have the heater on, so that's good. Uh, been a while since I managed to watch one of your streams. What did I miss? Well, Skyzel, what you missed last week was that we blocked out this character, uh, Crane, from uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, a little fan art piece, always fun. So, yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, Val Wizard, hey, Ian, nice to be here listening to your podcast. Useful stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Happy to have you here. So, of course, like anything else, let's put some music on. And then if you do have any questions, ZBrush questions, Max on One questions, please let me know. And we can go ahead and get that party started. So let's turn on some tunes. I always like to play a little bit of background music, but I also try to, to make it so that you can hear it, but also not too distracting. So I think we found a good volume adjustment. But if you hear tunes, cool. If not... That's okay. I could turn it up. Random question. Don't you use glasses anymore? That's a great question. So actually, I get this a lot. I do use glasses. I do not wear contacts. My glasses are not for seeing, though. They're for muscle relaxation. I have a thing where my eyes, my eye muscles uh, kind of deteriorate <laughs> they get weak really quickly and so the glasses are more to relax my eyes when i'm fresh and, and and perky like i am in the morning uh said no one ever i'm not a morning person but when i'm like fresh and i have not been straining my eyes so much i tend not to really wear them i only try to wear them when i'm like really noticing i'm having a hard time focusing so i try not to use them all the time but yeah actually i need to make an eye appointment so thanks for reminding me <laughs> I used to try, I, <clears throat> I used to do contacts for like a hot minute, but I hate contacts. Oh, so, so much. Um, something like it just, I have deep eye sockets and look, I don't know if you can tell, but I have a toe thumb. I got a nice big fat toe thumb <laughs> and it's hard to get contact. And I've, I've hurt my eyes a little too many times. So, so I say, I say no to that. <laughs> All right, so let's go into uh, a few things. First things first, let's hide this guy. We need to make a tongue for him. He needs a tongue a little bit. And I'm wanting to open up his mouth just a teeny bit. So check this out. We're going to go to our uh, uh, subtool. Not Nope. We're going to go to transpose master. And then we're going to go ahead and do t-pose mesh. I'm going to open his mouth a bit, which is going to help us work in the mouth uh, a little bit more than normal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
use the mask lasso and I'm going to kind of just I'm gonna just kind of lasso up this area right in here boom 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 like this say something like that I'm also going to just maybe just paint a little bit here okay great let's hide this for a second I'm gonna grab I'm gonna hide everything else by clicking everything and I'm gonna mask this off as well so we got this um, actually let's let's do this let's mask this guy right here and this guy right here because we're only opening the mouth part so we'll do a nice soft blend there we go the idea here is I just want to get into his mouth a little bit more give me a little bit more sculpting space it's really it simple easy peasy lemon squeezy send it back let's see here uh yeah the eye touching thing is just a no for me right yeah it's, it's such a no for me I, just, I can't do it let's see uh val wizard i am a beginner at zbrush but i've done some modeling for 3d printing and i got a problem with having small models like 100 millimeters the details are not good uh for out al for allowing allowing Halloween? Halloween? Do you mean? Um, any advice? Oh, so, okay. Do you mean Halloween? Um, ha Halloween? Do I, hopefully I understand that correctly. If you mean Halloween, um, as in, the, you know, uh, shell and object, um, you could do that in ZBrush pretty easily. Um, there's, a, there's some steps to it. Um, however, I would say that, like, is something that's starting to get small... Like so, what hundred millimeters? So you're talking about four inches. Depending on depending on the thickness of something, it's it's that's pretty small. So, you know, in my opinion, depending on what it is, like if it's a miniature of sorts, that seems a little tall for a miniature. But if it's you know if it's something that is pretty thin, you want good wall thickness. Um, sometimes I just leave my models solid. Uh, it's not a lot of resin to be used. It depends on the shape. That's a question where it's like, it depends on the shape. If you've got like really thin like capes um, and it's a hundred millimeter tall, you know, but your thickness is two and a half millimeter, then, you know, just, just print it. Now for detail keeping, you want to cut your details in a little, a little harder. You want to scribe them in a bit better. Um, but ultimately, um, yeah, if you can clarify, if you mean hollowing, then I can, I can, uh, maybe point to a couple of suggestions um, real quick I'm going to be adding some more detail to him while we do this I have this tendency where I talk and my hands freeze like my parents used to say I couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time sometimes they're right so um, we're also going to make a couple extra changes to him I know we did the zebra mesh trick where I showed off last week how to kind of loop this that's fine um, now that his mouth is open and stuff like that like I, I just want to see if i can add some detail to him a little bit more without uh you know getting rid of the mesh itself so something like this okay here aloe aloe mm, okay hold on one second i need to look up that term because i'm drawing a blank in my head let's make an alloy Mixing metals. Alloy tin with copper to make bronze. Another explanation of that is this is to be slaying, <laughs> which is slang. Uh, bronze is an alloy base of two metals. Okay, well, um, hmm, interesting. Um, I've never heard that term used for 3D printing when it comes to like resin or filament. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you. I would have to look that up. I've never really used, never really used that term in the 3D printing world, but I don't print with a lot of metals either. Um, as far as mixing materials, which alloying would be mixing of metals, as a mixing materials, it, 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 as long as the materials, like I actually just mixed Tenacious with um, ABS like resin and got great results. Uh, mixing of materials is quite common uh, as long as you get, the, as long as you're mixing the right materials. You know, if you mix like fast ABS with slow ABS, you're going to get some weirdness because that's two different, um, there's two different types of curing 
uh, times for that. But if you take two materials that are similar in its cure time, like tenacious and fast AB and and like ABS resin, that's not fast printing, just like standard mix. Those two work well together. As an example, um, is is that what you're referring to? I would have to look this up though, to be honest with you. Never heard that term in, 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 in the context in which I'm putting it in my head, so I apologize. Oh yeah, metal. Oh man, I don't I have not played with metal 3D printing, to be to be quite frank. They actually print in resin then gold in them. Oh interesting. Exactly, yeah. I'm not familiar with that. You know what, Val? You gave me a homework assignment. Not gonna lie, I'm very curious about that. So I'm gonna go check that out. So very cool. I'm always excited to find new, interesting ways to do things. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. I will tell you, in the, in the FDM world, I did try some, like, bronze-based filament and, and uh, copper-based filament. And it was fine. I found that I really needed a strong, like, uh, diamond-tipped or heat-treated-tipped uh, nozzle for that, um, which is pretty cool. But um, not my favorite materials to work with as far as filament goes. But in the case of metal printing, I don't have a lot of experience in metal printing. Um, when I was in aerospace, we had a company we'd re reach out to, but they were not telling us any types of secrets. No no trade secrets were, were mentioned. So yeah, I'm gonna look it up. Very curious now. Okay, so I'm just doing a couple things real quick while we go on here. Yeah, it might be Ben. Yeah, that's a good point. Ben says, sounds like the questions issue is uh, uh, um, re uh, re related to the scale and the printer you're using for the alloying. It, it's possible, yeah. What's up, Ryan? It's great to see you too, bud. Yeah, that 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 totally makes sense. It could it could be. It could, that's the thing though, because I'm unfamiliar with it. I don't want to guess, but um, I mean, when when normal, like I'm experiencing some printing issues right now on on um, my Apex Maker. Uh, where it's like my prints are failing and I've narrowed it all the way down to need new FET film. <laughs> and and uh, it was like everything else it was like, check the temperature of the resin, uh, you know, like try to like new support systems and stuff. Sometimes it's, you just got to start trial and error, uh, you know, R and Ding it to make sure that it's something that, you know, you like I got to find a, a specific problem. It's quite interesting. Okay, so here real quick, I'm gonna just call it out. So my eyelids are wrong. So my lower eyelid is actually further out than my upper eyelid. And in anatomy, if you were to look at any human's face, for the most part, now he's a human brain, but look at any human face, and you'll notice that the forehead usually does the step down thing. Like here, real quick, let's pull up a tool. This will be actually. Pretty good example, I think. I pull this guy up here. Let's see here. Okay, great. So if you look at a human head for the most part, what we want to really pay attention to is you got your eyebrow, then you have your eyelid, and then you should have your lower eyelid, right? And you get a little bit of a step in between there. So the upper eyelid should be further forward, and the and the lower eyelid should be further back, uh, quite typically. So in this case too. Looking at this character right here, this looks, this is wrong, right? So I want to push this back a little bit. And this is a good way to, to kind of check ourselves here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this, hit F, and we're going to just pull that back a little bit, all right? And then we're going to go ahead and select the face itself. I'm actually going to grab the move infinite. I'm going to pull this back. And actually pull this forward just a little bit. And then for the eyelid, again, for the eye, I mean, we're going to go ahead and pull that back. And get that just a little bit more accurate. The reason why I'm using Move Infinite is because I can just pull everything forward and then I can correct ever so slightly. 
There we go. And we're working still very low res at the moment. So right now I'm just using dynamic subdivision. Uh, so it's giving me just a little bit of that low poly look, but I could still kind of confirm everything. And I also do want a nice little shelf to his eye. So we're just gonna pull that back. Yeah. If the details are lost in any print, you may want to cut in a lot more though. Go, seeing that comment, Val. Um, a thing that I like to do, hopefully this is helpful for you, is that I use the occlusion uh, preview AO when I'm like checking my prints. And something to know, actually, let's do this. Let me load another model that can really demonstrate it well. Let's see if I have it. Where do I have it here? Let's see. All right, I need to go hunting. In one second, let's slide this off here. Let's type in a model real fast. It's an older one, but... No, not that one. Let me see. Do I have it? Ah, there we go. Okay, this one should be pretty good. Let me see. Ah, there we go. Okay, so let's just take out a look at a print in general. So one of the things I like to do for keeping detail, which I can answer on this one a little bit easier. First thing is I like to grab a material that's easy to read. So something like a basic material is going to be really good. So here's the Ken Masters uh, uh, true, like a fan art piece I did last year. And one of the things that I really paid attention to the most was how deep something was. So a trick that I've been doing is going up to render, preview, oh, and turning on that occlusion. And what's neat about this is if I'm kind of curious on how deep something is going to be, then as I'm cutting, right, it's going to give me that AO shadow right in here. So for example, if I start like really diving in here to his, his uh, deltoid pec area, then I can start coming in and adding some of these detail lines and it'll start giving me a nice shadow. And if you have this at something that's fairly low, nothing too crazy complicated, you know, you don't want this uh, feature at like 50 or 60, but like 20 to 30 is pretty good. This actually is a good indicator of how deep something can be. So this is one way that you can go about doing this and you can kind of see like, oh yeah, that's looking good. You wanna push your details further though than you think you would when you're doing any type of stuff that's prepped for 3D printing because ultimately you're always gonna lose detail. No matter what printer you're working on, the range of detail loss could vary between five to 15% detail loss. With resin, it's easier to capture more detail because it's a liquid turning into a solid, and that naturally will just conform to, um, to a, a, you know, to the mask that's being produced for that layer. And so then it has a it has a natural uh, tendency to print at a high fidelity. Now I'm not quite sure with metal, but metal even when it's powderized in the print process, which I'm assuming that's what you're doing. So that might be laser etching at that point. I'm not sure what printer you're working on. But if you're working with powder and layer etching, then you know, you're dealing with uh, the fact that you're still working with small like little pebbles or, or sand, grains of sand that then have to melt, liquefy, and spread out. And physics would suggest that you have a solid that's turned into a liquid that hardens back to a solid. You're going to have a lot of uh, some sort of you know, uh, uh, information loss. So that's, that's one way to go about it. So pushing through it would be pretty good. Um, the other thing that you could probably do as well, I don't use this feature myself that often, but if I go to, let me see if I can find it real quick. I need to remember where it's at. It's been a couple minutes. It's not under there, where is it? Give me one second. My brain is booting up. You know, 
Is it under? Nope, not that one. Give me one second. Why is my brain? My brain is dead. I apologize. Oh my goodness. Just like this layer. No, where is it? I'm just going to go through the layers until I see it. I'll know when I see it. That's, that's how often I, I use it. I use it this often to the, <laughs> to the point where I'm like, where is that feature again? Um, do -ba -do -ba -do. I think we're getting closer to it. Not more poly paint. There it is. Under poly paint. Under poly paint, you can actually use from thickness or from draft. And this will analyze your model. Of course, it's going to analyze the draft of your model, the angle and stuff like that, which you can easily adjust. And you could play with this for a little bit. Uh, quality from thickness would actually be pretty good. It's going to paint your model, of course. But like, if you want a high quality from thickness, you can. it's going to kind of give you an idea of how something is. But again, you're really looking for depth of cavity. You can adjust this, and you can play around. And I think we have an acid brush I could point you to on this. Um, but it's really going to analyze your model and take a look at whether or not your model has that information that you're looking for. Um, so it's quite useful to have a visual representation. And there are some toy companies that actually use this feature for that, especially if you shout something out and you're really looking for it. So ultimately, you could come through and just go a quick pass on this and see if you can get a draft on it. But visually speaking, and with your printers, because every printer varies, it could give you a little bit um, uh, different of information. So now based on my scale, it's gonna red flag some areas and stuff that it thinks might be too thin because I did the from thickness, et cetera, et cetera. But what you can see here is if a lot of this here is blue, which blue is good, green is good, yellow, not so much, orange and red is not so much, then it should pass fairly well. So again, really just cut those details in. Think of it as like, if you want this to look like this in your print, then you probably want to cut more like this, as an example, not that nasty. So you're, you will wanna push this a little bit further. So take, just take a nice lazy mouse and do this. What's cool is there's some tricks as well. You can do a just last. So as you're detailing, so let's say you're like, okay, I wanna detail this forearm here. So I'm gonna come through, add in this line here, this line here, this line here. You could actually step back after you make your adjustments, or you can just go ahead and mark originally a history marker up here. Go ahead and make those adjustments, and then you can adjust last, and you can push this either out or in, and all of my strokes now are being affected. So it's not just the original stroke, but then this adjust last will allow you to push that detail in. And so what I recommend is that when you're prepping for 3D print, like you're done with your character, now you're prepping, save a ZPR with stored history because you can always go back and push these details further by just marking that point in history of all those details you want and then adjust last forward. And then that, that should help you at least retain a little bit more detail. So it could be just, it could be something along those lines. So that was my, that was my detail rant for the week. <laughs> yeah, cavity mask would be pretty good for animal fur. Honestly, the same advice I just mentioned right now would be perfect. Just push your details further than you think. If you think you have enough information, go a little bit more. When are you coming to London again? <laughs> now that I've been living here for a while, I can recommend better places to go. Skies, I definitely would love to go to London again. Trust me, uh, I would love to. So, uh, you know, I may even just have to take a vacation, guys. That's a thing I hear. I hear people take vacations. <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, eat, uh, let's see. Um, Yorick says, hey Val, for some jewelry casts, I increase the contrast for texture areas. Uh, yeah, deeper and bump the raises up. Very hard edges will help you preserve those details. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's give this guy a tongue. That was something that I mentioned I was going to do and then completely didn't do that. So let's add in a nice little sphere. So yeah, so hopefully that uh, helps you out with at least getting some more of that detail.
Okay. Actually gonna go kind of wide with his tongue because he has a wide mouth. Just make sure, yeah, that's close enough. Okay, cool. Blah. Okay, great. So now, <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to turn on symmetry at this point and I want this to be low, as low as I can go. So Z remesher, I'm gonna go ahead and drop this down and let's just Z remesh this. Uh, that's, let's go one, boop. Yeah, there you go, perfect, that sounds good. And then here, let's just sold this out and I'm gonna grab the uh, damn standard and we're gonna go ahead and just boop. Ooh, that's a little too much. Boop, there we go. Nice little, nice little soft spot right there. Kind of build up just that area just a little bit. Okay, and let's give it a kind of uh, tongue color. There we go. Okay, and then what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to come in and I'm going to push this up a little bit like that. And then I'm gonna grab the move infinite and just kind of give it this little bit of a arch to that, just, just a little bit. Now let's go ahead and push this back. Also what we can do too, actually, I'm gonna just deflate this a little bit. So I hold control and just control and dragging that scale just gives it a little bit of a deflate. There we go. Say something like that and we'll push that down. Now I'm gonna have his teeth, I've seen pictures of him with gums, but I'm gonna have his teeth coming out of his body a little bit. I think that's just gonna be a little a little bit more interesting, a little bit more gross. So it's a choice I'm willing to make, but I think it'd be kind of cool. Even though he has a tongue, I think this will be fun. So now my resolution is quite low, so I'm actually going to subdivide a little bit because this detail is gonna require a little bit more information here. Let's see, how can I curve a mesh around another mesh? Ooh, great question, great question. Here, I'll show you a really fun technique that will be really good for you. Give me one second. All right, let's come up here real fast. Let's do a nice little smooth relax. There we go. So again, this geometry is fighting me just a little bit. So let's kick it up just a bit. Get that subdivision happening. There we go. I'm using a rough alpha at the moment just because I think ultimately it's fine. I like it. I'm gonna push this in a little bit. I'm gonna push this up a bit. So one thing I like to do with my teeth is I like to give it a little bit of like information showing that it's actually embedded in his face. It's not just, it's not just, you know, sitting there. So I push a little bit up here at the top. Like I'll zoom in here and we'll get some of this info coming in. And then we'll kind of puff this area up a little bit as if the tooth's embedded and then I'll carve down underneath the rest of it and then do like a little light smooth. I'll just make it seem like it's all coming out of his face. There we go. Say something like that. Okay, great. Let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Oh, it's saying I can't save over that. Okay, it's because I changed a few things. So let me go ahead and hit save as. And we're just going to call this 0, zero, zero, zero 001. Okay, so curve around another mesh. Great question, great question. So let's go ahead and do this. This is perfect for belts and stuff too. So I'm gonna go ahead and stamp this over here on this side. We're gonna grab this guy and then let's just do make poly mesh 3D. Okay, so the easiest way to do it is to utilize frame mesh. Okay, so I'll show you a few different tricks on that. So first let's just get a, a more pleasing color. So frame mesh. So frame mesh can work in a few different ways. If you actually come up here to stroke I'm gonna dock this on the right-hand side just so you can see it. If you come over here to stroke and go to curve functions, you actually get this feature called frame mesh. 
and you are allowed to do this based on your border, polygroups, or even your creased edges, which is really, really cool. So if we take something like this, for example, and say, okay, I just want to do the border of something, I hit frame mesh, you'd be like, well, nothing happens. Why? I see an edge right here that should be a border. Well, a border would be more of something that actually is not connected to anything. So we should, in theory, then come down here to polygroups and group by normals. And then if I just pick this guy right here and then delete hidden, so modify topology, delete hidden, come back up to the top, frame mesh. Now you can see that the border works because there's no connected mesh to it. So it's the border around your mesh that is not connected to another mesh. So that's one way to go about it. Now if we go back here to our polygroups, because we did our group by normals, I now have different polygroups. So I can come up here and say, hey, frame mesh by polygroups and it will do the same thing on a closed mesh. And then of course too, you get the point, creased edges, blah, blah, blah. Now, let's say I want a custom one though. You're like, I need this to go around a body specifically and give this guy a belt. Not a problem. This is where slice curve comes into play. So slice curve comes into play because I can add custom edges like this. I can slice in different ways and make this a little bit of a unique bit, right? Say something like that. Now I can come through here and say, hey, I wanna do the polygroups. So now I'm gonna go ahead and say frame mesh through polygroups. Now I have this curve that's aligned on it. So now I can come through and say, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and grab my curved tubes or actually let's go our curve alpha. So let's do the, the um, hair, the hair one right here, curve alpha. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab, I'll grab this funny shape. I'm also gonna make an adjustment to this real fast. So I'm gonna come up here um, to our curve itself. Sorry, not our curve, our curve modifiers. And I'm gonna turn off size so that I don't get a variation in size. So now if I click anywhere on this curve, now I'm gonna turn off the polyframe for a second. You can see I'm now getting this mesh wrapping around these different frame meshes. So this is this is a really like good way to go about it and get something wrapping around your your mesh. Another way you can go about doing it is if you have a curved brush. So I'm gonna come through here. So like curve tubes is a good one. Or I'm sorry, let's go curve tubes here. If I start drawing out and I have poly groups. So let me actually come back here. I'm also gonna turn off. I'm also gonna turn off history because if you have history turned on, it's going in on another sub tool or another project your curve brushes are gonna to wanna to snap to that point in history. So make sure you don't have any history markers turned on. So I'm gonna come up here to my polygroups for a second, group by normals. So as I start dragging out, if I have different polygroups and I start dragging out and I press and hold shift, it'll now allow me to snap that curve around the mesh completely. So I just start dragging out, press and hold shift. It's gonna identify that edge loop. And if it's a nice clean edge loop, like the one I have here, it's now gonna go ahead and wrap around that area. And you can see here, I can actually angle this too. It doesn't have to be perfect to that edge loop, but I can say something like this. So going through, you can do something like that. And now it's wrapping around and respecting that topology as much as possible to get you the look that you're going for. So there are quite a, there are a few ways that you can do that. How did I make the magnifying glass? I hit shift and M for magnifying glass. And that actually could be adjusted up here in preferences. And then I can come on down to magnifying glass and I can actually adjust. I can make it much bigger. 200 radius, I can actually do the zoom, how much it zooms in. So we can say, I like to do two zoom, that's good. You can even do like if it has a shadow to it. And then also too, you can make it so that it's like like what the warpage of that curve looks like. So you can make it fish-eyed if you wanted to. Well, that's a little ridiculous. <laughs> and then uh, you can also have it nice and sharp like that. And then if you like that, you can just come up here and say, that's my magnifying glass. And you can say store config and you're good to go. So and then every time you hit shift and then M, it turns that magnifying glass and you can see clear as day. Yeah, yeah super helpful. Uh, Imperial Fist, yes, yes. Uh, we are aware of um, an FBX uh, issue, and we actually, as a team, have uh, recognized that. We've got some support 
tickets on that. So uh, because you're asking me directly, yeah, 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 we are aware of it. So hopefully something soon. Yes. Also, too, with the move topological breasts. Yes. Yes, we are aware of that one as well. Thank you guys for bringing that to our attention. And just, just as a reminder, too, if you guys do have something you notice in ZBrush, you know, we like as as an artist myself and somebody who uses ZBrush, not just for work, but obviously for the industry and stuff like that. Like I've been making toys and 3D printing and game assets for a while, and I love it. Um, at the end of the day, we can't catch everything. So it's awesome and it's super important for you guys to to always have a voice. And one of the reasons that you, you um, one of the things that you get access to always, especially since you know we do subscription, is the fact that you have a support center. So please utilize this. Anytime you find an issue where you run into a bug, the fastest, easiest way to get eyes on it is to come up here and put in a support ticket. So you just sign in, create a support ticket, and somebody will get with you as soon as possible. So things like that, that's how we heard about those features and we're uh, not working as intended and we're super excited to have been pointed that out too because again, we didn't quite catch a lot of things. So, and it happens, you know, everyone's human. So um, at the end of the day, you have support. If you guys ever catch something in the future, like, hey, this, this, I'm, I'm not sure about this. This seems like an issue. Just send it in and we'll get eyes on it. Nope, but hey, great question. I mean, that's the other thing too. You guys are here and you're you're asking me, and I can I can when I can share something, I absolutely will. All right, so good stuff, good stuff. All right, what I'm going to do now is actually continue. Not that alpha. We're going to go alpha 18. Let's continue with this guy just a little bit more. So I'm going to drop this. Boom. Say something like that. Smooth this out. Okay, great. I'm also going to uh, add a little bit of droopiness to him. A little bit, he's a little too, he's a little too, uh, too clean here. I want him kind of consuming and being blocked up up here. Nope, nope, not a problem, not a problem, guys, not a problem. All right, my this material here, I want when I work on characters, I like using the uh, I like using the skin shade four. It's one of my favorite materials. Helps me see things just a little bit better. So, and what's fun here too is you know I want to be able to uh, push in this mouth bag just a little bit more. So I'm going to do something like that. There we go. Just a little something, something. This helps me sculpt in it. Can you already talk about ZBrush for iPad? Uh, when it will be available? So at the moment right now, we're still we're still putting all that stuff together. It will be coming, do not worry. Uh, our team is very proud and active on the development of that. And as soon as we have more information and when would that all will come out, don't worry. I'll be screaming it from the rooftops when, when I'm able to. So as of right now, no, I cannot say an official date, but the team is working and they are really excited, as am I. Believe you me. All right. Got a little bit of a mouth bag in here. I'm going to go ahead and do some painting here. So I have this color, right? But now what I want to do... Oh, where's my draw down here? There we go. I want to do a little bit of a paint, and I want to add just a little bit of uh, some shadowing just in the back here. So I like to paint a little bit of of, uh, of a fake AO in the mouth. Just ever, ever so subtle. And the reason why I do this is just for my own visual. I kind of just uh, bring a little bit more life to that and give me just a little bit of visualization on how that is starting to look. There we go. Let's get the mouth just a little bit more. And at this point here now, we're just kind of kind of just reshaping a few things, giving some detail. There we go. Just kind of moving. Okay. Now we have that. I do want to make this controller for him to be holding. He feels like he needs a controller or some sort of vile or he needs he needs something 
right? He needs another prop, and then we also want to refine this as well. Yeah, I'm excited for the iPad, absolutely. Very, very cool. Okay. Things are starting to look a little bit better. I'm gonna use clay tubes now. And what I wanna do, this is a little aggressive. Don't be aggressive, don't be aggressive. We need some clay tubes to highlight a few of these areas and make some of these shadows stand out. And again, if we go to render, I have that occlusion. And that's helping me see some of the possible shadows and depth of this object. Or, if, sorry, this object of crane. There we go. So just get a little bit more of that info. Yeah. So um, I'm just utilizing the, it's kind of my own design a little bit. Um, really, I've looked at some of the other initial designs of him, pulling more from the 1980s cartoon show, if anything else, but just taking a little bit of things that make him him and then kind of just making it my own. So yeah, I'm just kind of doing this off the top of my head a bit. There we go. I haven't given him any expression whatsoever, so as of right now, he's just kind of he's just kind of drooping on a chair at the moment. But let's move into some hard surface work a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and just save this, and then let's do this. So at this point, let's grab this guy. Okay, so we have his chair. I want to bring up a bit. This, okay, actually, I just noticed his mouth is a little bit. He needs a little bit of a chin. There we go. A little scattered brain sometimes. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. All right, I'll take that. All right, let's get this controller there, and then, and then we can move into finalizing his chair. So I'm going to go ahead and just, I'm going to append a basic cube something like this switch colors and then we're going to go down here to initialize <clears throat> and let's pull this down to just the cube cube and we'll dock this up here up front and we're just going to kind of figure this out so let's just let's just see what we can come up with so let's put him right here boop so this out there we go I'm just gonna get a control, a simple controller with a dial and a screen. Nothing, something that looks functional but has absolutely zero, zero function. Is there a way to increase the tolerance of a Boolean? Uh, yes, there absolutely is a way to do that, and that's literally just by increasing the resolution before you do the Boolean. So, I could show that real fast. <clears throat> so, let's actually, let's go back here to this guy right here, this, this beautiful guy. So, resolution. So, first things first, let's put it in a folder, call this tube cut. Boom, perfect, sounds great. And now we're going to add in another mesh. So, and let's add in a sphere. Turn off solo for a second. Okay. So the thing to remember is, let's say we come in here, we want to add live boolean, right? And then we want to add a cut. So now we're getting this. The thing to remember is that the topology of this sphere is going to affect the topology of this cylinder. So notice how there's almost no information here on this cylinder whatsoever, but there is a lot of information on this sphere. Well, what could be an issue is that if we were to turn this off and do a cut, so let's go ahead and Boolean this folder. Now we have something like this. You're now going to get this information. So it has to, ZBrush has to take the information between the two meshes and figure out the best way to connect them. And if there's almost no supporting edge loops 
at all within this area, it needs to now figure out the best route in order to do that. So in this case, it created a ton of triangles to all connect to the proper uh, edge, uh, the proper edge loops as possible. So a way to go about fixing this is to go ahead and let's just delete this guy. Let's come back up here. And now let's add some topology. So you can do this via subdivision. You can come in here and say insert. You can add your own different type, right? I can add a bunch of information here, even down here if I needed to, right? So then I have this. Now, if I come back in and turn this all on and I go ahead and make that same cut. So let's come up here to Boolean, Boolean folder. Now let's take a look at this mesh. Notice now that it did a much better job with that. Now it's still creating triangles because this mesh information is more dense than this mesh information. So let's improve upon that just one step further. So let's go ahead and delete that one. Let's go ahead and turn both of these on. Let's pick this guy, right? And now I'm just gonna go ahead and do a simple crease by polygroups. I'm gonna go ahead and divide one time and then I'm gonna delete. And now it's gonna give, I'm gonna delete lower. Now it's gonna give me this type of mesh information, right? So now what I'm gonna do is we'll turn solo back off. I'm gonna go ahead, come up here and go Boolean folder. And now let's take a look at this one. And you can see here now that the topology itself is a lot better. However, it's still trying to stitch that together. But the closer your mesh information is from one to another, it's gonna give you a cleaner result. And what this will also do is give ZBrushmesher a better chance at ZBrushing what we need. So now if I say keep groups, turn off smooth groups down to zero, adapt the size down to zero. And let's just go ahead and say, you know, half of our resolution that we have here, I'm just gonna go ahead and zero mesh that. Now it really understood that level of topology and how well that is. But if we were to go back into time here real quick, cause I deleted everything. So I'm gonna go back into time to this information, right? And I'm gonna turn all this on and then I'm gonna go ahead and say, Look, let's go ahead and bully in this folder now. So going back to this, you could still get a good zebra mesh out of this. So like this shape isn't super complicated. So we might be able to do something similar. We'll say, you know, half of what we got, smooth groups down to zero, adaptive size, zebra mesh that, and we could get a good result. But this is simple shapes. If you start getting into more complex shapes, then you might find that uh, it may not be as as good as it could be originally. So my recommendation to get this type of result, what we got here, is to make sure that whatever mesh is the lowest resolution, try to match it to the mesh you're cutting against. So that way you have a much easier time getting the results you're actually looking for. <clears throat> So let me know if that was helpful for you. No, you mean uh, when, hold on one second. Oh, sorry, you mean, um, yes, geez. I, I've told you my brain's everywhere, I apologize. You mean the thickness of something. Hold on, no, I mean the things are very close, it creates very thin parts by increasing the tolerance it should shouldn't create very thin parts so live bullying is a is you would just need to if i'm understanding correctly now you would just need to you just need to make sure that you're not cutting in any thinner than you need to um if you had something like this and let's let's see if we can replicate that there are a few ways you can go in and correct correct a shape so let's, let's try to recreate maybe something like this. So first things first, because you're on live Boolean, right? You have the, the ability to see in real time. So, and I understand in a perfect world, you may or may not absolutely have the correct tolerance. I understand that, right? Like, so you, you try to match as much as possible, but let's say something like this. So let's get, let's get this thin. So let's cut this. So this is pretty thin. This might be pretty thin. Let's see. Yeah, that's pretty thin. So let's do this because you could probably just use zebra mesher for this. Um, the thing is, is that once you do a live bullying cut, you have to remember that it's it's a physical change. So it's it's now just kind of restitching. So you would need polygroups in order to do this. So if I were to come in here and cut this, right, this part right here is going to be super thin. You could just use 
your Z modeler and Z uh, Q mesh with Polygroup Sol. Start dragging this out and press and hold Shift, and that will make this a lot thicker. So if we were to, let's see how thin this is. So I'm gonna go ahead real quick. I'm just going to create this right here, like half real fast. Let's just cut this. Okay, so you can see how, okay, you can see how thin this wall is here, like we said. So we could, just like I said, with Q mesh, you could, ex you could expound upon it. You could do it the other way too. You could come inward and pull this in because it's now a physical change to this mesh. So this mesh at its own now has those polygroups to do that. Um, as far as like, there's no way to just go in and just be like, okay, boom, move this and by 12 millimeters and you're good to go. Like that's, you can't do that. But what you can do is use something like zero mesh to make that adjustment. So something like that where I cut this out and then I made that change. That would be a way about doing it. Um, yes, wall thickness is super important, absolutely. But that's why Live Boolean was created because you get to see that in real time as you're moving around. So you get to go in and actually figure a lot of that out and then make those changes. And a technique I use a lot to check my actual prints. So something like this, let's say I wanna check this guy. I need to check the internal structure and the thickness of some things. So if I append this shape, so I go here, I drag this up like this. No, nope, wrong one. Grab this cube and I drag this up here. Okay, and I come in here and I do this. I'm gonna set this to cut. I'm gonna bring this up and what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll start pushing this down. And I'll start looking at the internal structure and I'll see something. And if I see anything that f f red flags to me, I'll go in and I'll correct that. But I can check the thickness this way as well. So something like this part here, on this one, I can actually come in and check that thickness. So I could say like, okay, let me do, let me grab this part right here, and then I'm going to, wow, we don't need that color. And then I'm going to just grab my gizmo, I'm gonna grab my transpose, and I'm gonna measure from here to here, right? And that's 1.92 millimeters. So that that's fine, I'm okay with that. So that's a way that I usually go about checking it. So hopefully that's helpful, but yeah, with this, with when you do a live boolean cut, you'll want to be able to move that mesh. The, the ideal world, you'll want to set that thickness as much as possible. And before you commit to a change, you can do that, right? You can come in and check that thickness to make sure that it's good to go. And, and it's just an extra step. So let's say I didn't have this piece here, but I had this piece and I now need to check this thickness overall. So let's turn all of this on, but now I set that cube in here and I'll grab this tool and I'll say, okay, let's, let's measure this. So I'm gonna go ahead with my transpose tool. I'm gonna to say, okay, from this point to, let's grab my transpose tool. Hold on one second, let's grab a different brush. W, Y, boom, transpose tool. And from here to here, I could check this thickness. And this is too thin. It's 0 0.02 millimeters, that's, that's too thin. So then I make that adjustment in the cut. And I do that here before I even commit to that Boolean change. So then I would check that. Yeah, it's hard to explain. I actually have, I am planning a prep for 3D print uh, stream for DPP, um, hopefully soon. That's gonna cover a lot of this topic, but a lot of it is a lot of math. Prepping for print and live Boolean cutting and making sure something is thick enough is gonna involve a lot of math and a lot of time. Is there a possibility to create some sort of tool to match the polygon number of both meshes? Um, I, in ZBrush right at the moment, not that I'm aware of, um, but it's always an idea. Yeah, not a problem. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? Do you want all of your uh, subtools to be solid all the way through for print uh, for printing? So for the most part, yes, because especially now slicers are super advanced. So you can actually, you, there's a lot of different slicers with a lot of control on exactly how 
um, how thick you want something, how smooth you want the inside structure to be. Right now, you can do it in ZBrush, but it's with it's with uh, DynaMesh hollowing at that point, right? So you'll want to make you'll want to make sure that you you take your mesh, you bring it in, and you merge it in order to get something that you want. And you can shell in ZBrush, but it's through DynaMesh. So um, in, in a lot of cases, it's it's one of those things where it's like you can set all that stuff up, but if your model is solid at a ZBrush, then you can make changes externally in the in the slicing software to get a lot of that what you're going for so it really is up to you i've done both and it's really not super complicated but again at the end of the day for printing itself the slicing the slicer can sometimes be just a little bit faster for your workflow but at the same time these are things that we're also talking about so it's 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 one of those like if you wanted to shell uh, let me see if i let me do it real quick here if I wanted to shell this with DynaMesh, so here, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to just duplicate, no, not the folder. Let's just get, um, let's, yeah, let's duplicate the folder real fast. Always, that's good. That sounds good. Let's grab this guy. I'm gonna delete this. Okay. So if I wanted this right, right here, if I wanted to do this with DynaMesh, so turn that guy off. Okay. So I wanna do this with uh, DynaMesh, right? Like that's what I'm gonna to wanna to do here. So I would need to first come in and I'm just going to quickly get a resolution and have my mesh dynameshed here. So this mesh is dynamesh. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna just set this one to dynamesh as well. Because why not? Should be pretty good. Okay, great. I'm gonna open up everything here. Now the thing is is under dynamesh itself, you have you do have a create shell, right? So I'm going to I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to put this kind of in here. In this case, I'm also going to duplicate this mesh. Okay. I'm going to shrink this one up. I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to create a hole within a hole. Boop. Super advanced. So if I were to hide this one for a second. Sorry, hide this one. Make sure that this is... Connecting into that. Okay, that sounds good. That should be perfect. Let's turn off this. Now I'm going to set this to a negative. So I'm going to set this to a negative cut. Now I'm going to, real fast, come in here and I'm going to merge this down with that negative cut. So I'm going to say merge down, merge down. Oh, sorry, merge down here. Yeah, okay. So now it might be a little hard to see. But this is white. If I remember right, it's been a couple days. Let's find out. Boom. Okay. So when it's white and I do my DynaMesh cut, oh, I think I messed up. Let's back up. Oh, you can't back up. Great. <laughs> Did I do it? Yeah, I, I messed up. Hold on one second. Let's try this again. So I'm going to go ahead and let's DynaMesh this. Boom. I'm going to duplicate this. Here, let's go transpose real fast. Sorry, let's come in here. Let's do that guy. And I'm also going to duplicate this guy. I made it way too complicated, even for myself. So I'm going to say, let's say I want to shell this object. So I want to hollow it out. So I can do this, that, and the other. And I can do all my measurements, check everything, make sure it's what I want. Again, set this to negative. Grab this one, and I'm going to merge down. Now I'm going to turn off lines for a second. I'm going to go ahead and do a merge down. And I'm going to say, boom. Now, notice my polygroups are white. And I have polygroups that are white, and I have this that is not white. So if I click and drag this, it's going to use that white polygon, and it's going to go ahead and cut out the information on the inside. So what did I get? If you look on the inside, I shelled that manually with the hole. And of course, I was able to measure and check that. So this is a way you can do this in ZBrush, which is super cool. Now, if I back up in time for a second, if I remember right, if you come here to your shell and you do thickness, so it'll say thickness of four, I think all you need to do requires a subsert mesh insert for an opening. Perfect. So what we need to do now is just have an opening for this. So the second way, using the shell method, let's duplicate this real quick. Say yes. We need a hole for an opening. So I'm going to go ahead and put a hole. Say boom. There's my hole. A little bit different, right? So now that's, that's 
impeding into this mesh here. I'm going to pick this guy. And then I need to, I think I need to merge down. Probably do the same thing. I'll do a cut and I'm going to do a merge down. Pretty sure that's the way you do it. So I should have something like that. Is that right? It's been a couple days. So hopefully you're bearing with me. <laughs> Let's go to DynaMesh. Create shell. Yep, that's it's thinking. So now it has a mesh that's sticking out that notice that it's it's together. We'll give it a second. And we gave it a wall thickness of four. Drink some water. You were told there'd be no math? Who told you there'd be no math? <laughs> All right, so that should have done it. Yes, it did. It, yes, it did indeed. So if we open this bad boy up and we take a look, you'll see here that it got shelled out based on the thickness, right? So let's do this. Let's go here to double thickness, right? And we, we'd have to measure this. Now, here's the thing. You see all the stepping on the inside? This is what that shell created. So the Boolean option of DynaMesh would be a little bit easier and more to control and stuff like that, but you're able to go in there and make those changes. So it's definitely a solution in which you can do to get some custom shapes. But if you do the first part where you just kind of create your own internal mesh, you can make that super smooth, super clean, have it so you stick out, and then just do the DynaMesh shell. But then again, too, you could just do live Boolean and in itself get that all situated and then just and then just do the boolean operation so there are two ways to do it so if you don't want to use dynamesh you can do the boolean operation that way or you can do the dynamesh method or you can do it this way which the shelling itself is based on a dynamesh i would recommend that for the thickness set the scene scale first and foremost so you can get an accurate measurement of what that is right now that shell is reversible, so I can come back and say, well, let's do, let's do 20. So four was obviously way too thin, so let's do this. Let's see what we get. Hey, what's up, Travis? Yeah, changing the poly paints on your queue for checking uh, for checking makes seeing the edge easier. Yes, absolutely. Whoa, that's cool. <laughs> Just got a bamboo printer and looking forward to printing ZBrush projects. Love that there are always five ways to do something in ZBrush. I know, right? Yeah, it's super awesome. Yeah, anytime we do anything prep for 3d printing you have to remember that you are you're you're manufacturing now so we've taken off our sculptor's hat and we've put on our manufacturing hat and when we're manufacturing there are tolerances you want to you want to adhere to and this is what really comes in very much uh, a recommendation for every 3d printer you do is create yourself a test cube of your standard keys that you like to use or at least a, a certain key that you like to use and then create um, a project that you can load in to your new printer, add your supports, do whatever you wanna do, get it situated, right? And then get that on your printer. So then your first print should be that test cube. And then you gotta see, does that fit in? Do, does the same tolerances on one printer fit on the other? And then you just have to check that. Um, because it's manufacturing, like I said, it, there is a lot of math involved. So it's, it's all about just you know a little bit of R&D and then also too, that's why the 3D printing community is just as big and sometimes in some cases much larger than even the ZBrush community because a lot of people um, on the engineering side of the world have gotten massively into 3D printing, obviously. And so there's a lot of, of technical stuff you wanna achieve, but it's, re it's a lot of information, but it's not super complex. So there's definitely a lot of stuff we can do. But as you can see here, I'm trying to shell this out and this took a little bit of time. So now we did a 20 shell. And now if we take a look at this, boom, on the inside, right? You can see, okay, there it is. There's my inside shelling. So it, it's a good way to go about doing stuff. If you're gonna use the shell feature, make sure you provide it. All you need is one sub tool that's not welded, that is just in the same sub tool as this is, 
and then it will find the difference and cut out the rest. So super useful, very, very fun. Awesome, awesome. Any questions on that? We'll be moving forward with some other stuff. We're gonna be covering some good stuff as well in the future. Where's the Doki wear glove? And dude, I gotta get another one, but you know what? I do have my ZBrush glove right here. I do have it. So I have to get another Doki wear one too, because I like that, yeah. Can you copy and paste polygroups across the similar geo? I keep losing my polygroups when I import after doing UVs. Okay, oh, here's a good one for you. Check this out. I got a better solution for you. Not so much copy and paste, but check this out. Okay, we're gonna do this. So we're gonna go to UV. So on this guy right here, I'm gonna go ahead and we're just gonna do a quick uh, uh, unwrap by polygroups, right? So let's go to UV master, which is down here. And let's just unwrap by polygroups, bada bing, bada boom, and boom, we have our UVs. Yay, UVs, awesome, good job. So now what do we do? So let's say here, okay, you come through, and wait, hold on, sorry, polygroups across similar, keep losing after your, you import doing UVs. Okay, great, so now, boom, we have this guy right here. And you're like, where are my polygroups? I have my UVs, but I wanna work on my polygroups. What you can do, actually, which is really, really fun, go up to polygroups, and there's a fun little button that says auto groups with UVs. Click that and it's going to auto group automatically and it's by the UV count. So whatever the UVs were, it's gonna go ahead and do that. So now if we come back here, we morph out. You can see I have my different, I have my UVs back and I have my poly groups back. So that's it, just poly groups, auto groups with UVs. So yeah, when you import it in, Bada bing, bada boom. One button solution. Much better than, than copy and paste. How lucrative is the 3D printing business for making models? Very lucrative. Very. Because it is uh, most of the most of the toy industry uses 3D printing. Uh, aerospace uses 3D printing. Uh, prop industry uses 3D printing. Jewelry uses 3D printing. Uh, car manufacturing uses 3D printing. I mean, I'm a car guy, and I actually just watched this YouTube channel, um, uh, Throttle, awesome YouTube channel, uh, so uh, not sponsored. <laughs> um, anyway, and they actually got a body kit for a GR Corolla that was completely 3D printed. And it was a test body kit that was designed, and they 3D printed it, and then from there they moved uh, into the cast and mold phase. So it's very lucrative. It's in so many industries. It's very important to understand the 3D printing world if you want to get into making things for the physical world. Hey, what's up, Zachary? Awesome, awesome. Okay, so let's put him, <laughs> let's put him right back up here on the map. Um, tolerance. So what do I mean by tolerance? That's a fantastic question. And I can definitely explain that. So tolerance or something. Easiest way to explain it is a little bit of a show and tell. So I'm just going to, I'm going to create this new cube. We're going to solve this out. So tolerance is basically how one thing fits into another. It is the measurement of space between two objects interacting with each other. Uh, so the, the, the tolerance of that um, would be a physical number. So for example, if I wanted to create a custom key, which I'll do right now here, then I need to know what the spacing is between part A to part B. And there's gonna be some loss in that number when I actually print it, right? So then you need to understand how much, uh, how much that number might change and whether or not that fits correctly. So um, here, real quick, Let's do this. Let's create this in, let's just do it to this guy. This seems to be fun. So here, actually we can do, check this out. So, so here as an example, let's say, so I'm gonna take my gizmo here. So this point to this point, right, is about uh, 0 0.07 units, which is 0 0.7 millimeters. So a tolerance, how much am I allowing myself to have that fluctuation or that, or that play? So in, in manufacturing, they would say, hey, this thing needs to be 
five inches by four inches. Um, and you can only, you know, and really it can't be more than, it can't be more than uh, five and a, five and one eighth, and it can't be less than four and, and and seven eighths, right? So my tolerance now is between four and seven eighths to five and one eighths. I told you a lot of math. <laughs> so also I probably should have chosen a much easier number, but you, you understand. So if it's like one, and I have 0.9 and 1.1, that's my range. That's my tolerance. That's what I'm allowed to work within. So you kind of need to understand that a bit. So in this case, for key cutting, for example, so let's take a cube. So I'm gonna insert a cube, boom, it's something like this. I'm gonna put this in a new folder, call it blah, 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 blah. Turn everything off but this one guy so I can work in solo mode. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay, I need to add in a new key cut. So I'm going to create a custom key real fast. Let's turn on my lines. And again, let's do this, let's put this here. So I'm gonna create a custom key real fast. I've showed this workflow before, so I'm trying to just gonna blaze through it just a bit. I'm gonna grab my Z modeler, turn on, say, say, yeah, something like this. I'm gonna Q mesh this out. Can't have subdivisions, grab this out, right? Grab this. I'm gonna just scale this down. Do so I have my custom key. We're gonna do a key cut. It's going to slice through the whole the whole piece. We'll add in just a little bit of, of geometry information. Ba 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 ba. That's too much. So one, two, three, four. Okay, great. It's just so it has some good info. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so we have something like this. I'm looking looking fantastic, right? So now I'm going to go ahead and. We're going to just place this somewhere like this. So we have this, and what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to do dynamic subdiv, turn this on, add some thickness. Okay, and then I'm gonna go ahead and do a quote live Boolean cut. So we're gonna turn this off here, do something like this. So then this cuts, okay. So this spacing in between this is a bad key, by the way, but it's fine. Um, so this spacing right here, if, what is the spacing? So if I were to do something like this, and let's say this is, uh, this is 0 0.033. So this is very small. 0 0.033 millimeters is very, very tiny. Well, my machine, this would never, this would never be successful. These two parts, it doesn't have enough space or tolerance, doesn't have enough slack on the inside for this to fit correctly. So when they become in the physical world, they're not gonna mate 100% correct. So I would need to understand what my printer is capable of. And so if my printer was capable of much more, then I would need to give it more thickness. So then I can say, okay, from here to here now, as an example, that's 0.1, let's just round it up, 0.1. My printer might be capable of this 0.1 millimeter spacing and that is where I'm able to reside. I'm able to work in that. Um, again, it's a little bit complicated, but that's overall what I meant when I was talking about what your tolerance is of your machine. What is your machine capable of printing at? Resin has a higher, um, high, a higher tolerance rating, meaning that you can have um, less space between the two mated parts, and that space is perfectly acceptable, so then you can have just nice clean cuts that blend well together. And then there are some printers, like FDM is a good example, where the tolerance isn't as good as resin. The resolution isn't as good, so it needs more space because of expansion and, and, and uh, shrinkage that occurs during the hardening phase of the plastic being molten back to a solid. So that's what I refer to. Hopefully I didn't lose you in that, but that's what I meant in that shape. So something like this, creating something like this, with the ability to come back and adjust your project would be a great test benchmark for your machine in order to understand how thick your keys need to be or how deep that cut needs to be in order to be functional for your, for your model to be put together correctly. I am also very hot in here, so I'm gonna take off my sweater
Awesome. Okay, great. All right. Hey, Ian, is it possible to paint the brain? How does mixing colors for the brain work? Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's get back to let's get back to Kame. <laughs> Hopefully that was a that was that was a good example. Okay, painting. Uh, painting is super fun. Painting is. I'm not ready to really really paint them too much right now, but I'll show you a painting trick that I do. And the a big one. So painting is layering. If you've ever painted in real life, then it, it's kind of the same approach in the digital world. Painting something just requires you to have um, uh, the ability to layer each color on top of each other, blend it in, and merge it in together. The way I paint in ZBrush is kind of more of how, just checking the time, how I paint in the real world. I start with a base color, something that I really like, um, and it's usually like a darker color. So let's say I were to paint him so he looks pretty cool. At this point, what I first want to identify is um, the undertone. He's going to be kind of warm because he's a character with flesh, well, with blood. <laughs> blood and organic tissue, right? So a painting technique that I do, I first grab the main color I want him to be, and I'm going to go ahead and just fill that. So I want him to, I'm overall just knowing that I'm going to want this to be this color eventually, right? Now, you can use the layer system, but I like to do this I like to do this um, uh, just by hand, but sometimes I'll use the layer system where I'll come in here and I'll just turn on a layer. Um, but for this case, what I do is I first I'm going to grab a more of a purple color. So, and this is actually a fun technique that um, uh, a shout out to Justin Gobiefields actually. He uh, he showed me this paint technique a little while ago. It was really cool. So. We first want to identify shadows and highlights, and we can do this automatically, right? So we can fill it with a super like purple color like this. And then from here, I now want to start painting red on him. Now think of subsurface scatter, okay? So with subsurface scatter, right, things that are closer to the surface but are thin, like your ears or your fingers even are a good one. Um, as you get older and you maybe start getting some wrinkles in your neck, then that stuff, the way the sun hits things. So the deeper the sun has to penetrate or the light has to penetrate in an object, the darker that object will be. The closer to the surface, the lighter that will be. So in something like this, right, I would actually come in here with just my normal paintbrush. I get a nice soft one like this, and I just start lightly painting in a lot of these areas that are going to be highlighted. So any raised areas. And I'm leaving this purple here. So I'm coming in and I'm really going to be paying attention to like um, his eye sockets. His eyes in itself would have a lot of subsurface scatter, right? His lips as well would have a lot of subsurface scatter. Uh, this is a dark color, so I do apologize, but don't worry. We'll get there. So we do something like this. Maybe the tips of his, uh, the tips of his, uh, his little phalanges here, or his little hands, would be more red. And then I just do a nice light paint. You can also smooth, so I could turn off smooth add and just smooth color and start blending the stuff in. Now, I don't really paint with a lot of alphas, right? But we do have a color spray. And color spray can help you kind of randomize this a bit. And we can take it one step further by doing alpha seven and just kind of getting like a um, uh, kind of like an airbrushed look, right? So we can do something a little bit more like this and maybe increase the color just a little bit and just get a little bit more of uh, some texture buildup. So, and I would do this for the whole body, right? Now, let's say I'm fairly happy with this at the moment, we're just going to do some lighter areas. Again, a little bit of blending of that color. So I'd say something like this might be pretty cool. Okay, let's say I'm happy with this. Great. I'm going to move on to the next color, which is orange. So I'm going to take an orange color. And now I'm going to paint orange on where there's a lot of highlights. So I'm going to go over those red areas a little bit more. Now you may not see a huge difference, so maybe it'll go a little bit brighter. And we'll start painting this area a lot up in these areas. So anywhere I painted red, 
that I think would get a lot of attention. The lips area, maybe the eyelids. This stuff right here would get a lot more of that orange. I'm kind of blazing through this, but this is the, the overall direction. So say something like this. Bear with me here. Now we're going to go with some yellow. And the reason for yellow is, again, we want some really interesting highlights. So we've been painting the base tones of things. So again, I've come through here, paint a little bit of yellow on the areas that are really just going to be hit by that light. So very, very minimal. Same thing down here. So say something like that. OK, so let's say I'm ended up happy with that. So at this point now, I have some deep shadows. I have some highlights and stuff that I want to do. Now let's go back to this color, the color, the main color that I would really want. I'm going to tone down the intensity of this color. I'm just going to dock my color palette. Now I'm going to start filling that object. What you're going to see is as I fill this object in, I'm starting those highlights and stuff are starting to come through a bit. And I want to be careful how much I actually push that through. So now I have a lot more of that purpley tone coming in on the deeper side of things. And then I have a lot of these highlights starting to come in. So I've just kind of slowly built that color up to where I got something that was happy. And then at the end, if I want to top it off, of course, this was a very fast demo for it. If I want to top it off, I'll come in here with ambient occlusion and I'll turn this on. Now this is going to give me some shadows. I'm going to inverse that, right? I'm going to grab the color of that pink that is on that shadow side. I'm going to hide things. So I'm going to hit Control H to hide the mask. So the mask is still very active. Maybe I'll go just a little bit darker. Now I'm going to just start do is I'm going to start coming in. And I'm going to start painting in those areas. So let's get a let's get a heavier color. So I'm going to start painting this in a bit. And that shadow is protecting a lot of the highlight work that I did, allowing me to bring in some of these shadows. And with that Z plugin, that ambient occlusion is actually uh, is actually um, a GPU application. So it's actually giving me some fairly cleaner and more realistic ambient occlusion. And I would come in and start painting this up. And then I would just refine this a little bit more. And I would start going in and doing this and just refining and cleaning until I was 100% satisfied with it. But you can see an effect that you start to get. So the more you take your time and build that up, it's really going to just make things come through. Matt, what's up, buddy? Hey, fellow sculptors, how's the stream been going? It's been going great. Welcome, men, SVP365. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, so there you go. So there's uh, there's some painting one-on-one -on, -one on that. I use it all the time since I found out about it. Yeah, me too, Jamie, you too, yeah. Big brain. <laughs> so yeah, something like this would be re a really good approach. And that's actually how I'm gonna approach the, the painting aspect. And then I see a fiber mesh question in here. Fiber mesh is such a cool thing. So fiber mesh, you want to explain the fiber, uh, the fiber mesh, better understand it? Not a problem. Fiber mesh is actually quite a great tool. So if we come up over here to fiber mesh, boom, layers. So first, the basic understanding of fiber mesh is as follows. It uses your mask. Think of it like mass extract. It uses your mask to select a wide range of uh, an area in which you want to put your fibers. It's really that simple. Right, so here, for example, if I wanted to add some furs to his head, I can actually come in here and say, let's mask off these areas here. Woo, whoa, I'm getting crazy there, I'm getting crazy. I don't know, boom, slime kicked in. I don't know what happened just now. I don't know what happened, but let's back that up. You're crazy. All right, so let's come in here and let's mask off this area here, this area here. Let's just mask off this whole area. No worries, let's just mask. Boom, mask. Just like we would do an extract, and let's say we want to add some hairs on his, on his brain. So now with fiber mesh, the thing is, is that you could open this up, 
And what would open do? Well, it's gonna allow you to open up presets. So we obviously don't wanna hit open right away, but you can open up presets. You can actually come in here and just preview. And when you hit preview, it's gonna default into something like this. And it's going to kind of look weird. Now, the fun part is that it's based on direction for gravity. So I flipped him upside down, right? I turned off preview, turned it back on, and it gave me a little bit of an interesting direction. If I turn off preview and do this again, it's gonna try to fall into direction. So it's always trying to fall down from the direction of which you are facing. So we're just gonna solo this for a second. So in this case, you can just say like preview here, but then we have our modifiers. Now there are a lot of things here and anytime I show a big slide like this, where you have tons of information, I try to make this as simple as possible by basically saying, try something, just go in there and break it, it's okay. So for example, let's just start with the top, max fibers, what does that do? Well, it's going to stick a huge density of fibers in here. And if I reduce this size, it's going to have minimal fibers. And if I increase it, it's gonna have a lot more, right? Pretty simple. So we'll do that. From here, you can, you can fine tune. These are what I call fine tune sliders. You know, by mask, it's a one-to-one -one mask. You know, uh, what, by the area, it's trying to basically say, this is my mask. How can I really map it to here? What's cool is fiber mesh allows you to gradient your mask. And when you do that, it will respect that gradiency. And based on these slider informations, it will start to feather out naturally. So I like never touch these. I never touch these four. I only touch max sliders. Then you have length. How long do you want something? Do you want some long hair? Do you want some short hair? Do you want it super buzzed? Do you want a beard? Like those aspects, right? And again, you have, uh, you have a, like a length on the V so you have the ability to fine tune that. I almost never touch that. Now forget this length profile or this width profile for, for just five seconds. Like forget that. Let's skip over those and move to coverage. How much am I covering this mask? Am I covering it a lot or am I covering it a little bit, right? So these are your basic stuff here. We're gonna skip over these because again, this is just uh, more like scale root and stuff. I wanna skip over those and I wanna come down here to gravity. Do I have strong gravity, negative gravity, et cetera? Those are the main ones that I touch. Why is that? Because everything else is fine tuning it. I'm just trying to get a look and feel for that. So to understand how fiber mesh works, again, it's just based off of the mask. So if I were to clear my mask, it all goes away because there's no mask there anymore. But let's say I have a nice soft mask. So I'm gonna gradient this out a lot. Then I turn this back on. And now you'll see here that it's kind of feathering out. It's peppering out from the densest being in here, and then it's feathering out to the end being out here. Okay, then at the bottom, you have the ability to add any type of texture you want. If you had UVs, you could say, yeah, that's fine. Let's do that. So if you had any type of texturing uh, on the fiber mesh, you could add that stuff if you needed to. You can also change the color. You can come in and say, hey, I want uh, a red base with green tips. So then that means that the quote base of the, uh, if we were zoom all the way in here, really zoom in, you'd see there's a little bit of red and then it's feathering out to the end here. Now we've made this, uh, we tried to make this as simple as possible by allowing there to be presets that shift with ZBrush. So the light box, fiber mesh filters, I just open this up and then I'm asking myself, do I want grass? Do I want hair? You were talking about tassels and stuff like that. So you would have your main mesh tassel and then you would start to kind of just paint the mask where you'd want the fibers to come. So let's say something like this guy right here. So it's going to now branch this off and get really weird up in here on this side. But once I have a preset, I now can adjust that length and say, yeah, something like this looks pretty good. Uh, the max, I want a lot of hair, thick, thick hair. So it's gonna come in here and so forth. Once I have the basic shape, and this is why I'm encouraging you to play. Once I have the basic shape, I can then move on. But let's go back real quick to the length profile. So the length profile, it's just a straight shot. If you've ever used any of these curve graphs in ZBrush, then we'll know we can actually come in here and add an adjustment 
to this and have the hair kind of start small, go up gradually thick, and then drop back down. And I can even at this point make it really sharp transition. Press and hold Alt, grab that guy, bring it back, make it soft, back in, make it nice and sharp. And that can also give me another direction. And the same thing goes for the width profile. Do I want it to be, you know, wide too thick? and get kind of like a little bit of a curly effect. Do I want it the other way around, right? Completely up to us. So I want to go from thick roots to thin. Can I make that adjustment? Absolutely. I can inverse, I can flip that. Whatever it is I need to do, I can play and customize the shape of that. So again, just grabbing something that we like. So let's say I end up liking this guy. So I adjust the fibers down a little bit. So I don't want all this. Now I have this craziness popping out of his head. Say something like that, I can accept it. And when I do that, it is now creating a second sub tool right here that was based off of this mask. And this in itself is now geometry. And we do have some groom brushes. So if we come in here and we type in uh, um, B for brush or G for groom, you can come in here and you can actually grab some of these brushes and start clumping things together. Because now it's actual geometry. So I can come in and start clumping it together. Uh, what else do I have here? So I go B, G, I can do a, a groom strong. This is really crazy. So I have my hair brushes basically. Um, I can spike things, I can generate a overall spike and I can reshape a lot of this stuff. So it's all in just how you want to kind of manipulate that at this point. And you can have something like that. Now we have some spiky spikes on his head. There you go. Get some customization. So boom, get some hair that goes over there. Get some hair that comes over here like that. There you go. Really, really kind of craziness. Now, if you like what you, if you like this and you're like, this is I gave him hair, this is what I want to do. Now that I've manipulated that, you can come back over to your fiber mesh. So I'm going to grab this guy, go up to fiber mesh right here. I can turn the preview back on. It's going to remember that preset and I can end up saving this out. And if I hit save, I can just save this however I want and then I can load that for the next time. So that's, that's the overall foundation and how fiber mesh works. Chloe, what's up? Yes, <laughs> get that wig. Absolutely, right? Super beautiful. There you go. How would you add hair ties to hair? Uh, you would just, the same way you would model anything. Once you have the basic shape, then you would just add in the hair tie. You just sculpt a hair tie in, and then you can move, then you can move it around. Another thing you can do too, and this could be a little, um, this, this could be a little intensive, right? So depending on how much hair you have, I highly recommend anytime you're dealing with fiber mesh hair, be like, come up, uh, work in small chunks. Don't try to do all of it at once. Hair is clumpy. Anytime you look at somebody's hair, in fact, let's go, let's go one step further. I'm gonna go ahead and just grab a new Google tag here. And then let's just type in long flowing hair. Cool. Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and go to images. Now let's look at this. All right. So anytime we're talking about hair, notice the way this flows and comes up. This right here is a section. This is a hair section. And then this strand of hair that's coming up here, this is another section, right? So anytime we're looking at hair and it doesn't even matter if it's super straight hair or if it's curly hair, um, everybody's hair texture is different, but the way it flows, hair folds on top of itself and it, inter, it interweaves with itself really nicely. So as the hair is branching off, the direction it's going, hair naturally clumps together. So you wanna just separate out the way the hair strands are going. So this guy has some beautiful hair. So this part right here where the part is and the way this flows in, you can see a lot of black and white separation. So this chunk right here would actually be a chunk to work with and then this is actually going underneath and you're gonna be popping out from the other side. So you would break this up into groups. So before I even were to start hair in general, what I would do is say, okay, here's what I want. I want the idea of what hair is going to look like. 
right? So this guy got wild there. <laughs> so if I wanted to, I would just come in and I would say, let's, let's do some hair separation. First things first, let's grab this guy. Let's go ahead and I'm gonna want this guy to have some chunky hair. So I want, I want him to be spiked. That was what we were doing, it was pretty cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, smooth this guy's hair out. All right, I would have something that was, wow, I'm hitting all the buttons today. And let's actually lower the resolution to make life easy. So let's go over here, Dynamesh, super low. There we go. Also, how are you doing, Chloe? Welcome in, welcome in. If you guys don't know Chloe, uh, stop what you're doing. Don't listen to me. Go say hi to Chloe. She's a Seabrush live streamer, amazing artist. They are a really awesome, awesome. So please check them out. Really, really cool stuff. Amazing artwork. Okay, so we have something like this. Okay, this is what I wanna do. Great, fantastic. Well, the cool part is, is now we can use fiber mesh to kind of reshape what we want, right? So if I was just working on this, I could just mask out a good chunk of this area, right? I can mask all this out. Maybe I don't want hair right down here, that's fine. I'm just gonna come in in this section, say boom, boom, boom. And then I want you to then just think, okay, well, you know, maybe there's a few other clumps to be working with. So let's actually just mask off this section right here. So I'm gonna want this under section and I'm gonna work with just this. So I'm gonna go fiber mesh and let's open up. And then I'm gonna go ahead and say, you know what? Let's actually grab, that's more like grass. That's like a beard. Ah, forget it. Let's do, there was one I really liked. Was it this one? I think it's this one. Okay, this is more like grass, but whatever. This will work out fun. So now I want to work with this. Well, I want to, I don't need all this coverage, right? The gravity itself is pretty insane. So what I can do is, again, I can hang this upside down, turn off preview, turn that on, and then I can actually come in here and let's do our gravity so um, I open that up, boom, boom, boom. Let's close that, there we go, gravity. Let's turn that down to zero, or let's actually, let's inverse that. Let's float that baby up, let's go like that. So there we go. And then let's do the coverage just a little bit, maybe some length. So we'll cover this a little bit more. Max fibers down, there we go. So we'll get something like this. Let's try the length profile. So let's, let's make this nice and long. So we start here. So we turn the gravity like almost all the way off. Forget it, we don't even need that, that's fine. So we start with this section. We accept this, then we grab those groom brushes, right, in this case a clump, and I start shaping this clump with each other. Now something else you can do too, because you don't need to only work with the hair brushes, right? You can use move, but here's a cool part. We can actually do this. We can go to poly groups, auto groups, now we can use move topological and we can start moving one strand at a time. And if you wanted to go through this, this is gonna add some realism as well. Once you get the shape the way you want it, you get that realism coming in. And now we have some hair that's flowing in this direction and you just start building up until you get exactly what you want. Okay, okay. Yes, it is. You just hit accept. Uh, to convert into actual geometry, uh, you just come down here. Once you're, once you're done with it, hitting that accept. So fiber mesh and then accept, and that becomes, that becomes actual geometry, which is what I did there. Yes. Uh, th uh, oh, possible for 3D prints. Sorry, I only read half the question, so that was my bad. So would it be possible for 3D prints? Many sculptors use curves and basic shapes. So that is a great question, and I'm going to say that it's probably not worth your time to do fiber mesh at this level for 3D prints. It might be more work than it's worth, which is why you get a lot of... Um, a lot of very stylized hair choices for 3D printing because it's easier. 
And especially with traditional sculpting, traditional sculpting, we would just use a rake brush or a knife brush. You go in there, we'd add a chunk of clay, and then you start refining and refining and refining. And you refine until you are happy with it. You just keep working at it, right? So, however, um, if you were to attempt this, the problem with that is that it's going to be very hard to get this to be, quote, watertight. The reason why... So, I mean, I kind of explained it. So, yeah, so you want it to be watertight. And the problem with fiber mesh is that all of this is colliding and intersecting. And depending on the scale of hair, there could just not be enough um, uh, tolerance for it to actually weld correctly. And you could have a, a big mess on your hand. So it's easier to do some other tricks to get the hair doing 3D printing and so forth like that. So um, I, I would not... Rec I mean, I've tried it. It's not been super successful. Um, however, on a very low inversion of it, like, you know, if I had like a really big mesh, even still, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And it's not recommended by me. I don't recommend it. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Is that how you get long hair on a pre-sculpted piece of geometry that follows the shape of the S-curve shape? Yeah, so for so for the way I handle hair, I'll show you a trick on how I handle hair. Because um, again, yeah, you could use fiber mesh to follow the, the curve and the shape and flow of that, absolutely. But the way I like to do hair um, is, I, I call it the, the Dan Eater, the Dan Eder approach to it. I think it's it's a lot easier. Um, let's grab this guy right here. Let's do this. So a lot of the ways I do hair is I do a clump like, say, something like this. And then I grab the doo doo, where is it? I'm just going to reset my brushes, by the way, because my brushes itself are just, um, I just kind of modified them all. So let's reset all brushes. OK. So the way I'll do it is, the way I like to do it, is I'll draw my hair, my main hair shapes like this. Again, I'll get it nice and clumpy. So if I have if I have another piece, like let's say I grab this guy right here, and then I have another piece, and then grab this guy right here, and I have another piece, right, boom. I'll usually start with clumping out my hair like this. And then if I want the hair to be a little bit more uh, hair-like, then one of the ways that I do it is then once I have the shape, I'll actually come over here to spray, and then I believe, where are we, which one did I do? Was it Alpha 7? Was it Alpha 23? Um, maybe it's Alpha 23. Yeah, Alpha 23, so sorry, not spray. I'll use the dots, of course. Uh, not Alpha 23, I usually come up here to stroke. I, um, I like the size that's on there, but I'll go to curve, and I will turn off repel, because I don't want to repel. And then I'm going to go ahead and come up here, and I'm going to draw this out. And I'm going to follow the shape of my mesh. So I'm going to use this as underline. And then I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that curve. And I'm going to go ahead and split unmask. So now I have this. Now I need these to be completely one. I need this to be different polygroups, but I want them to be printable. So the first thing that I do is I go ahead and I inflate them together so that I know that they're colliding with each other. Okay. And then from here, I'm going to get rid of the tip of the hairbrush itself because you can see here I got all these little bits and pieces. This right here is all being uh, gone to a single uh, tip and then welding it. So I'll delete that. And then I come in and I say delete hidden. So modify topology, delete hidden. I'll then close holes. And then I'll come through here and then I will do polygroups, auto groups. Now I have this. And the reason for this now is I can come in here, I can either inflate other aspects, but more importantly, I can grab the move topological and I can start moving these different components. Now, uh, because of that move topological thing, I'll actually just come in here and start manipulating, maybe getting some strands, popping in, mask certain areas out, and I'll just start approaching this. And this is also helpful too, because you get some more flow with it. And I'll just, again, I'll work with this in chunks. So I'll go through and I'll modify this as much as possible. So 
grab this guy right here, right? Start fine tuning this. And I will cover this whole piece with this type of hair. I'll end up ultimately doing that. So I'll come in here, clear this up, maybe blow this up a bit, maybe move this in. And then maybe I'll duplicate this a couple times. I'll start getting this all blended together. Now, the reason for that is because this big piece is in the center of all of it. So now I can weld all these pieces a little bit easier and have a lot more control to this. I can weld all that together, have a lot more control, a little bit easier to conform to where <clears throat> fiber mesh has, a, I, like, I don't know how many pieces exactly I have and I'm able to work and get one chunk looking really good and then the rest of it can fit quite nice. So that's, that's how I've been approaching hair for like the last year and a half now. What's up, Emperor Cheese? Stylized hair, mm, yep, yep, yep. So yeah, hopefully that helps. All right. I love the direction that we went with this guy. He's, uh, he has quite the hairstyle for sure. Hair takes time. Like I'm just, just to be a thousand percent transparent, hair takes time. Like hair seems easy on the surface and then out of nowhere, I'm gonna tell you what though, I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna keep this hidden. I'm gonna hide this, okay? We're just gonna hold on to this for now. We're gonna keep this guy's, uh, <laughs> his locks are so cool. Anyway, it takes time to get hair correct. Hair is a character all in itself, believe you me. So you just wanna, you just wanna be patient, take your time and really just make sure that you're doing what it is you're looking for. All right. That being said, now what I'm gonna do, wait, what? Okay, cool. I hit a button, not sure what I hit. Let's try that again. Okay, great. Oh, I duplicated it, that's why. All right, so let's grab this guy. And we're just going to be making a controller for him. It's a little too narrow in that case. I'm not even sure what exactly I want this to look like. I want it to have a screen, so let's start with that. Yeah, not a problem, not a problem. So I want the screen to be, I want to divide this into three, to at least three components. That much I do know. So one, two, one, two, three. So I'm gonna want the dial down here. So maybe I want this section to be the main screen. Ooh. All right, so I'm gonna come in here, inset all and we're going to boost this up all the way to 25 to get something like this. Beautiful, uh, beautiful. And this will be my screen. I'm gonna push this in. So let's go Q mesh. There we go. I'm sorry, what? Oh, For some reason grab that side, not a problem. So I tap Alt a few times and get some depth. I'm going to now come in here. Let's go back to inset. I'm going to give it just a little bit of a wall here because I want to bevel this. Boop. So I'm going to hit that and I'm going to bevel that section there. Perfect. All right, that looks pretty good. Now let's come in here. I do want to give it a button. So I'm just going to come in here and we're just going to give it something like that. And I'm not going to be putting the button itself. Um, like the button itself is not going to be, it's gonna be a separate piece, but I'm just going to add a space for it right here. So I'm gonna get a big old dial right here. And then I'm gonna do this again. The reason why I wanna do that is I just want to come in here, Q mesh, I want to give it just a little bit of depth. Say something like that. And give it just a bit of a bevel. There we go. And then I can insert. There we go. So I'll have something like that circle, which is fine. Okay. Okay, now that we have that, let's go ahead and let's just add this in here. I want to give it just a little bit of a lip. So let's Q mesh this out. Actually, 
I lied. Here's what we're gonna do. We're going to, we're still gonna bevel that out, but we're gonna add some topology. Because right now, it's a little, it's a little gross. That's fine. I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this so far. There we go. Oh, do I want that? Do I want to do that? Oh, you know what? I just, I thought of another idea. I thought of a better idea. Here's what we're going to do. Instead of making it all attached as one piece as I was doing here, I'm going to drag this out, press and hold control. I want a little bit of a, like a lip, right? So I'm going to grab this and I'm going to end up separating. I'm going to separate this split hidden. Now I'm going to come in here and call this uh, con controller. And I'll check the chat one second. So this is the controller, call it controller base. There we go. And then we'll call this controller lip. Okay, now what I'm gonna do here is, I want this to be straight. This is kind of tapered right now. So I'm actually gonna go with clip curve. I'm gonna hover above that edge and I'm just gonna flatten that side down so it looks like that. And then I'm gonna go geometry, modified topology, make sure that's mirror and welded correctly. And then let's go over here to Q mesh. Let's give us a little bit. There we go. And then now what we can do we can actually get rid of this edge and this edge for now because we can angle this. So it looks a little bit more like that. That's kind of cool. There we go. And let's actually do polygroups, group uh, by normals. Yeah, that works out just fine. I want this to be a little bit thinner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna add a single edge loop like this, right? Actually, I'm gonna add two, say something like that. I'm gonna push this in. Yeah, say something like that. I'm gonna push that in there, push that. There we go, that should be fine. Or you know what I could have done, actually? Made that the hard way. I literally could have just done this. I could have done a uh, group by normals, which is fine. Split this down the middle, say so, something like that. Grab these two pieces. Grab this piece here. So now I have this one piece, which is totally fine. I can go ahead and delete hidden. And then here I can just come in here and Q mesh this just a little bit. Now I Q meshed it in the wrong direction. So why I did that, it's going to be a flipped normal. So I need to go to uh, display properties and flip that. So I can have something like that. And then I have a little bit more control of how that looks. Yeah, that's fine. Say so something like that. So not as thick. And then I can use clip curve and just make sure that's a nice flat edge there can also shadow sides important Let's kind of clip that like that so it follows a little bit more of what we're going for there we go so not as thick as before could also just scale that and make that a little bit more in the middle there we go <clears throat> let's see good stuff there uh, uh, would you use hair cars uh, like taking a plane, subdividing it, painting the hair in, and using a low poly plane with a texture map applied to it. I actually don't know much about hair cards. Hair cards is something I've never really had to do, because again, I come from the toy world the most. However, some of my friends who have seen use hair cards have used this brush here, which is the flat curve, which is just a nice flat curve. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know much about hair cards, so I can't answer on that. But um, I can always look it up too and, and play with it. I just never had to.
Uh, yes, you can ask the questions. Uh, questions are about layers in ZBrush. An example would be creating a character with a lot of parts, but at some point they can be compressed into a mesh. No one explains this. <clears throat> Looks like I'm making an OG iPod. <laughs> it sure does, doesn't it? Yeah, close enough. I guess I was inspired by uh, by my uh, millennial self. Um, so, uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, I use that here. Bane of existence. Absolutely. Uh, so, layers. <clears throat> so, your layer system in ZBrush. Well, the layer system in ZBrush... And by the way, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to this layer system in ZBrush because we also have a layer system up here in ZBrush. This is a document layer where like you're kind of you're kind of bashing 2.5D stuff together. So I'm assuming you mean 3D layer system, which is what I'll be referring to in this, unless you meant the other layer system. Um, so the 3D layer system itself here. One second, I'm going to grab my move, my Z modeler. Boom, grab that. I just want to delete that edge right here. Don't need that. Okay, great. So the layer system in ZBrush. The layer system in ZBrush is as follow, and I'm gonna grab a sphere to demonstrate this. So let me just save real fast. I'm gonna grab, yeah, switch, clear that out. Let's grab, I mean, hit the buttons here. Let's grab this sphere, drag this out, make polymesh 3D, beautiful. Okay, make polymesh 3D. Okay, sorry, clear my throat. All right, so layer system. Layer system has as follows. Every layer itself is affecting the mesh in one way, shape, or form or another. So what do I mean by that? So if I start sculpting with the layer turned on and I'm going ahead and I'm adding my clay on top of it and it's looking pretty good and life is really good yep awesome i love it smooth that out a little bit just build this up okay this layer one the one that's at the very top consider that the bottom layer everything that i do to this layer will be affected by another layer if i add another layer so in this case i'm just working with one and this is going to affect this mesh now keep in mind that the layer system is subtool dependent so i cannot do one layer here with multiple subtools. I can only work on the one subtool. And one of the reasons why we call it a subtool, not an object, is because you can have multiple objects in the same subtool. So I could have like like quote have multiple versions of this, right? In itself that are not welded together. So just keep in mind that this layer system, when I turn this on, there it is, it is directly affecting this one subtool. If I insert another another uh, sphere, that layer system is not turned on. So that's the first thing to remember. It's subtool dependent. So going back to this subtool, here it is. Now, the thing is, is let's say I'm done and I stop, I recorded it, it's happy. I can adjust this. I can actually set this to go the other way. Let's grab a better material. Perfect, there we go. So I can affect this. I can either scale it back down or inverse it at any point in time, okay? Now let's say here that I sculpted this and this effect is not as strong as I want this effect to be. So now I can stack another layer on top of it. I can either add a new layer, so I can add a new layer and start sculpting even more. And then when I stop it, now here's the thing. I can adjust this first layer, but see how it's now affecting the mesh on the second side. Right, or I can affect the first layer, and it's affecting not only the first layer, but it's also affecting how the second layer is is being displayed on that. So I can combine these different layers to get different effects, but they're all affecting each other because it's all on the same mesh. So you're able to really stack these. Now, it is very useful when it comes to blend shapes because if I were to, so we're gonna do this, just real fast. I'm actually going to delete both of these layers and I'm just going to create a mouth. Just a really ugly, simple mouth. Boom. 
Great, it's wonderful. Now I have this. Now I have my main shape, which is what I'm starting with. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to turn on a layer and we're gonna basically close this mouth. As much as we can. I'm actually gonna come up here to brush. Here's a little trick. Come up to brush, go up to auto masking, turn on topological, change your range down to something really low. And I can actually get this a lot closer. There we go. Okay. So now my mouth is closed. So I'm gonna stop this. I'm gonna hit record. Now I can open the mouth even wider. Or I can close it all the way. So now I have my base mouth. So I can say, let's name this uh, close to open, right? Now I have a close open. So at, at zero, it's normal. At negative one, it's open. And at negative, I mean, a positive one, it's closed, okay? Now what I can do is let's say I need to, the mouth to widen. So I'd create a new one. And now I'm going to, now notice I'm in my base form. I went back to my base level. Now I'm gonna widen this. There we go. Pull this back. Ah, yes, perfect. Now I'm gonna go ahead and say here, and now I'm going to have this effect here where I can widen it. So now I can, what I can do with this I'll rename this, call this widen. Boom, done. So now I can open the mouth and widen the mouth. Or I can close the mouth and widen the mouth or make the mouth kind of go in a little bit. But see, now we're getting some pinching. So let's say we want to basically like correct this, right? When the mouth is closed and it's pinched, we want to correct this effect here. So we would say, okay, let's go ahead and make a new layer and we're going to correct this effect. So I'm going to pull this back down just a little bit. There we go, a little bit of smooth to get this effect, okay? And then I'm gonna stop it. I'm gonna rename this. And I'm gonna call this, uh, uh, we'll call this uh, widen correct. Keep it as simple as possible. So now I can put this back at the zero, put this back at zero, right? And now I have this effect. So let's close the mouth. Let's let's shorten that in a little bit more, and then let's make that adjustment. Now, how do we bake this? How do we make this real geometry, right? So from here now, we just need to, with our current settings, say bake all. And now we have a mouth that is closed, and it went ahead and it had all those corrections for us. When you do that, however, notice that my layers now shut off. So it's important to know that the way you can get around this is to control shift D duplicate, right? Let's go up and select the other mesh prior. So we'll have our first mesh, control Z that, and you can get that layer system back. If you control shift D or duplicate a a, um, a subtool with the layers on, it will also bring the layer system from that subtool because you're duplicating the subtool. So you're duplicating the layers. So then you could say bake all, and then you can call that mouth. Oh, that's closed pinched, right? And then you can always have your regular one that you can come back and readjust. And this is this is the, the starting points of blend shapes. And this is a lot of what would be used. You can just type in zero. So this is a lot of what would be used uh, when they're trying to get the understanding of the look and feel of the character. And this just takes time to set up. But again, it's subtool dependent. So once you get something that you like, you then can go in and start correcting that. Also, a really fun little random fact is let's say we create a new one. Actually, let's do this. Let's say we have this guy here and we want to add some details. So I'm just going to real quickly add in uh let's see here let's go like this and let's just do this and i'm just going to i'm going to subdivide this a few times right and i'm going to want to punch these details up 
So check this out. This is a really cool trick. So let's say I have all these details. And I want to punch these up. A cool trick is I can actually turn on the actual uh, layer system. And I can smooth these down. Doom, smooth. Now I can turn off that recording and I can start punching it into a negative. And it's going to start making those details even stronger. So this was before. And then afterwards, this is after. It punches that detail in on the negative front. So that's how some people will do uh, some detail enhancement for their 3D prints. <laughs> Boop. Uh, how did you, uh, how did you, how, how should we present our samples? You said you worked in the toy industry. Why did you walk away? Is it an age related or you wanted to break away and just because honestly, because this job became available. Um, I love ZBrush. I've always loved ZBrush. ZBrush has given me a lot of opportunities. Um, I came from aerospace originally, and then I moved into Photoshop work that followed into graphic design. I eventually found my way into sculpting, uh, 3d printing. I was introduced when I was in the man in manufacturing. Um, I still love toys. I still, uh, I still have, will do freelance projects from time to time. The cool part is that I really love ZBrush and I love teaching ZBrush and I discovered this along the way. Um, I still would have been working at Funko because I used to work at Funko before I worked at Maxon. Um, and because of that, so um, I walked away because I love passing knowledge, I love sharing and I want to give back to the community. And when this job became available shortly after Maxon acquired Pixelogic, they put up a job posting because they needed uh, another ZBrush trainer. And I was already on the ZBrush Live team. So I put in my application as a prospect to, you know, help give back and be a part of it. So um, they accepted me and that's why I'm here. Uh, this was a job I actually, this was a dream job, a job I really wanted to have. And uh, it just, it feels so awesome to be able to be a part of something that is obviously much larger than myself so it's it's great and i get to be in involved with zbrush and you know hopefully uh help leave a mark in a community that is ever growing and and ever desiring to learn knowledge so um did i fully walk away from the toy industry no not at all no um I, i've still taken some freelance projects and stuff inside um, but I also have done some other projects. I actually last year was grateful enough to work with the band Blink-182 and do a fun project for them. Um, this was like one of my favorite bands, by the way, just hashtag shout out to, to that. Um, but what was cool was um, this project specifically, I got to be a part of this, where they launched this last year for their, uh, their world tour before they break, broke into the tour that they're going to be doing this year. So a lot of fun stuff, I was really excited, and it started out as a fun project. Um, as far as like your toys and stuff like that, presenting, the easiest way to present it, in my opinion, is 3D print it. Whatever your design is, just take one of my favorite pieces, Darth Grogu, and uh, what's cool about this is that you, I did this 3D print, and then I always show the clay version, I show a nice render, but I also show the keys in itself and how it's broken up and how it's affected. So you'll see a breakout here, what pieces were done. So the, what this shows is that I understand key cutting. I understand that uh, how to prep a part and have it work in the real world. And also two, how to keep that detail. And then three, show the fact that you printed it. Show how it looks in the real world. It doesn't have to be perfect. A lot of companies have their own key cutting system. Uh, they have the, their own team that deals strictly with that because they work very closely with their own machines and there's a lot of fine tuning to make sure that it's proper. So anytime you can show the full model in a fully nice render, you show the turn of it, show a clay render, show a colored render, show it 3D printed, show your keys. This is this is like, we have it a little bit easier than in, than in games. So you get to kind of showcase that that breakdown as much as possible. Here's another one that I did a while ago, Chung Lee with Vega. I actually have a few pieces I wanna get back up on my Instagram, I mean on my art station, but I have all of this here, show lots of renders, show the clay render. And then from here, I didn't show the keys here for some reason, I'm not sure why, but I showed the print off a lot. And again, you're just, what you're proving is, quote, I can 
make something digital and bring it into the physical world. That's really what you're showcasing. <clears throat> So yeah, you're way too late. No worries, no worries. Well, we, we go until one now. We got an extra hour. So let's do this. I want to try to finish at least the design of this controller so I can walk away today <laughs> with like, I, I did a thing. Uh, but these are great questions and I'm loving it, guys. So seriously, fantastic stuff. Love it. Hopefully that layer system one answered that question as well. Uh, lots of fun stuff with it, but you know, blend shapes are actually quite fun to do they just you know they take time and you just want to make sure that you build it correctly so you work with like a good shape and you move forward uh, let's do group by normals here awesome and the reason why i wanted to do group by normals is we're just going to go to our crease by paul gabriel's boom 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 so then i can get something a little bit nicer now of course i'm getting a little bit of uh of breakage right here because we're not really supporting this edge. So this edge here is collapsing and we don't want that. So let's go here to boom, boom, boom. Let's grab this and I'm just going to go inset. There we go. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay. And now we're going to come in here and we're going to grab a single edge loop. Mm. I actually don't. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Actually, you know what we could do? We could just crease this edge. We could do this. We could go crease. Not really worried about the topology. So I'm just going to do something like this. That's fine. Make sure I turn on symmetry because that will make my life a lot easier there we go yeah that's fine it's good enough for it's good enough for what we're trying to achieve perfect so we have something like that now and let's go ahead and let's make a dial so i'm just going to do uh i'm going to insert a cylinder pull this up like here and actually i want this to be I don't want to have any unnecessary edge loops, so let's go to edge loop. Let's do delete loops. Rotate this down by 90 degrees. Move this up. Let's scale this down. We're gonna make a, a, a dial. A, a dial? So let's move this down just a bit so it fits in this area very nicely. And then let's skinnyify it just a bit. All right, say something like that. That's fine. I'm going to show you guys a little trick right here. If you guys didn't know about this, we're going to mask this off. I'm going to control drag this edge loop. And I'm going to bring this, say, something like that. And then I'm going to control drag as well. Say something like that. And then I'm going to control drag one more time and bring that in. That automatically does a bevel system for me, which is awesome. And I'm just going to go ahead and do insert multiple edge loops. Boom, 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 boom. Say something like that. That sounds good. And then let's go ahead and add in just a couple things. Say something like that. That should be fine. Perfect. And let's get this in there so it looks like such. I have too many shapes and things, so let's just solo this out for a second. There we go. Just gonna go ahead and bring this down. Bring this down. Just a little bit too tall for me. Awesome. Okay, cool. And let's actually do something. I want like an arrow on where it would be quote pointing, right? So let's do that. So let's grab this guy. Let's go ahead and save. And we're just gonna go ahead and we're going to just get a plain 3D. Sell this out. Let's do slice, let's do slice curve. Boom. Boom, say something like that. And then let's do mirror and weld. 
Awesome. And let's do delete hidden. Let's bring this in, say something like that. And then let's just do Z remesher, same. It's good enough. I'll dig it. Actually, I could have done this another, I could have done that another way too. Another way you could do that. <laughs> well, how many ways can you do it? I don't know, tangenting today. Let's just go right here like this. Let's go ahead and delete higher. Let's go ahead and just rotate this 45 degree angle. Say something like that. Is that 45? There we go, perfect. Come through here, slice curve that, grab that guy. Delete hidden. Done. Even easier. Even easier than the way I just did it, so boom. Scale this down. Shrink this bad boy, there we go. Do, 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 do. Let's bring this in. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I just overly complicate it and I don't need to. So let's go here, let's just bring this up, give it some thickness, drag this down. Make this actually embed a bit. There we go. I at least have a little bit of a dial right there, which is fine. So now we need to add some details to this and make it look a little bit cooler. Let's get a screen going. Uh, you want to make a American football player toy, but you need to design where to start. If you need to design, just look up American football and just write down the basic stuff of so like, okay, this is the type of helmet that they have, this is the type of jerseys they have, this type of cleats they have, what their padding looks like. Um, you just need a generic human to start. So just come up here to, uh, in ZBrush, just come up to project and just grab like one of our base mesh, like our male or female or our demo soldier base mesh. Just grab one of these, just load it up and then just start, start, uh, start the design process or even just you know like sketch it um yeah just like ultimately like just kind of sketch a, a look and feel there we go okay something like that should be pretty good let's get a screen wow i i don't know if you guys heard that but i whistled so <laughs> loud <laughs> it was so uh, so crazy I, I did it. I don't even know. What, I don't know if you guys even heard it, but I heard it. I was like, what? Okay, so um, let's do this. I want a screen now. So I'm going to. That's the best way I want to do this. It's the best way I want to do this. And let's go plain 3D. Actually, let's not do plain 3D. And let's say that we did. Let's duplicate this. And I'm going to grab this starting mesh. And I'm just gonna go ahead and delete hidden. So let's go geometry, modify topology, delete hidden, perfect. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mask off the centerpiece. I'm gonna bolden this just a little bit. Okay, and then I'm going to from here yeah, okay, so if I smooth that, it's gonna get a nice bevel to it, right? So what I wanna do now is I wanna support some of this geometry. So I'm gonna come in here to inset, inset this just like such, okay? And now I wanna add some support. Actually, let's not even do it that way. It's too complicated. Let's just add, because I love how I change my mind literally the moment after I do something. I'm like, we're gonna do it this way. No, we're not, we're not doing it that way. Psych! Uh, let's come here, let's do this, let's do that. Yeah, that, that works out. Okay, so let's back this up. So we have this, and then now it's going to just naturally kind of give me a nice fall off. So I'm going to, before I start subdividing, let's actually smooth that down just a bit. Let's come over here to Q Mesh. Let's drag this up, just give it some thickness. And then we're gonna start subdividing. There we go, this should be pretty cool. 
then let's scale that up just a teeny teeny bit actually let's lower this and let's do one other thing i wanted to kind of like I said i kind of wanted to bevel a little bit so i'm gonna grab these edge loops grab these so I'm really gonna be bringing it up like such there we go so it has a nice little bit of a screen arc to it yeah there we go that looks cool push this down a little bit and we'll just let that embed there we go that's kind of cool say something like that now let's give it an antenna because I feel like that would be the, the cool thing to do. So we'll call this dial. I'm gonna duplicate this. We'll call this antenna. 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 Okay. <laughs> and now let's go ahead and move this guy up. I'm gonna rotate this around 90 degrees. Sometimes there's no point in actually reinventing the wheel. dial this down and we'll put this off on the side here we go say something like that now let's do our infamous polygroups group by normal and then I'm actually gonna hover over here do polygroup give me a different polygroup here and here so that way I can just come in and I can just Q mesh that out There we go. I'm gonna scale this up a little bit. And I'm gonna scale this in like such. Like that. Drag that in again. There we go, say so something like such. And then let's do that. And then I'm going to do this, flatten this up here, come over like such. Actually, let's drop that back down. Let's come in like that. And then let's come in. Let's angle this. Perfect. Say something like that. I'm going to come in here. We're going to go insert multiple. Add a little bit of a rounding edge to that. There we go. Save. All right. We only have a few more minutes. We have about 30 minutes or so. We can stretch this out. But now we have now we have this little bit of an antenna here, which is perfect. Let's add a back panel. So then we start really just kind of designing this thing and really getting this shaped up the way we want it to. And really, again, I'm just kind of making this up. Like, we're not really doing anything super crazy let's actually go v3 let's turn this on and let's just get this looking pretty good and i'm keeping 3d printing in mind which is why i put the i put the little uh dial thing here um I put that arrow right there so it'd just be really easy to to work with that in and itself so now we don't need that guy right there we don't need these for v3 so let's get a little bit of a back panel how does one become a member of the zbrush live team I love hearing how you uh, came down this path into becoming a ZBrush trainer. Oh, thanks to that one artist, aka Dorgley. How you doing? Um, so ZBrush Live. So if you want to be a ZBrush Live member, there's an application process. So basically, like, um, I, I don't know if it's actually at the bottom of the stream now. Let me see. But um, literally, like, we're always looking for artists. So if I come here and I take a look real quick. I just mute myself for a second. I'm looking at seeing if it's at the bottom of the description. I can't remember. I 
honestly, you just kind of ask. And then we take a look at your portfolio. We take a look at your knowledge of ZBrush, um, what it is you want to do on ZBrush Live. We basically just go through all that. We go through an interview process. Um, and then you just kind of, uh, and then we, we, we see if it makes sense, if it's a good fit. Um, and also too, if there's room for it, because artists come and go, not everyone stays on, but yeah, um, it's, it's really just an application process. So if you have interest in doing ZBrush Live, you could just reach out to me and then I can give you my email or contact. Um, and so then we can go from there. So you guys know me as Iris Sculpts, uh, but yeah. It's really just an application process. Okay, it's gonna scale this up a little bit more actually. And I'm going to real quick, uh, entry level 3D printer. Um, so entry level 3D printer, I actually recommend FDM printers as entry level, um, as a good place to start because you learn a lot. Like you learn a lot. Um, there we go. So I would say, um, any, any type of, of FDM. Like I, I started out on, I actually started out on, um, uh, 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 was it a clone of like a, uh, of the, uh, Prusa printers. There was companies that had like similar designs, but not as expensive, but also they weren't that good. Um, but any type of like, like Creality, like Ender is pretty good. I think Bamboo has a new one now. I think Anycubic has one. Like just literally look up an FDM printer and then you'll find a lot. The, they're more maintenance required than your resin printers, but there's more safety precautions with resin than there are with FDM but you end up learning a lot about the process. It's also super satisfying to watch. And ultimately at the end of the day, um, you just get to make some cool stuff and you can make some practical stuff. FDM printers are bigger at a cheaper price than resin printers are. You want a big resin printer, you're gonna be talking, you know, up into the thousands of, of dollars, right? You want a big FDM printer, you a couple hundred bucks US. So, so yeah, something like that. Um, is, is pretty, it's pretty, you know, pretty ideal starting spot. So I would just look up anything like that and you should be, you should be pretty good. Okay, let's make a back panel. That's what I, I was uh, wanting to do that. So I'm going to first kind of see how big I want that back panel to be. So I'm gonna, again, I'm not really concerned about topology. I'm just more building and shaping. Ah, this will be a good back panel right here. So something like this, what I'm going to do is come in and do, um, I'm going to just Q mesh it in. Say something like that, touch that a couple times. Sounds good. And then I'm going to drag, I'm going to then hover over this. Sorry, what? I'm sorry, what? Okay. Man, why is this happening here? Do I have a mask on? No, okay. I'm gonna control shift D, duplicate that, grab this panel right here. I'm gonna go ahead and just delete hidden. Okay, and now I'm going to just scale this down a little bit. Boom, say something like that, just so there's a little bit of a space. And then I'm gonna go ahead and Q mesh this out. And I'm gonna make sure that that's intersecting just a bit. So I really just want like this, I want this little bit of a crease back here that indicates that there is a connection. Say something like that. So it just indicates that there's a connection. Nothing more, nothing less than that. Right, and then I'm gonna come in here and we're just going to, we're literally just gonna have some even topology. So I'm going to just grab this, boom, 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 boom. Grab that guy, that, and that might be a bit much. That might be a bit much. Yeah, say something like that, which is good. Now I wanna basically add some quote, like screws to it. So I'm going to add one here and one here. And then I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna do split. I'm gonna tap, 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 tap. And then I'm gonna Q mesh that in. 
Okay, and then we're gonna inset like that. All right, so it just gives us a little bit of a little bit of space to work with. So if I do this, it's going to round that those areas out. And of course, two, I'm gonna want two polygroup group by normals, and I'm gonna want to crease. So we're gonna go crease PGs. So that way it gives me a nice kind of semi nice rounded area. Oh, I see what happened there. Okay. So let's actually increase the tolerance. So I did group by normals. So first things first, let's actually just do this. Let's just do crease. And yeah, that's better. Just do basic crease. Okay. But it is creasing this inside and I don't want that. So let's do crease. Let's undo that crease. Undo that one. For some reason it's creasing these edges and I don't want that to be creased. But I do want Yeah, something like that. Great. Okay, that's better. So this out for a second. Let's zoom in. So it's creasing these areas, and I don't want those areas to be creased. I'm not quite sure why it's doing that, but it is. So I'm just going to go ahead and decrease these, make sure that they're not selected. It's polygon actions. I don't want that. Okay. Go boop. And boop. Okay. Perfect, all right, now that that's like that, let's go ahead and just grab a, let's grab a, dust, um, sorry, like a Phillips flathead that ships with ZBrush. And let's just come in here and let's drag that out. So it kind of just fills, fills that area in. And then we can just control drag, stick that in there. What's cool about this, we can kind of get it in there. We can rotate that just a little bit so it offsets. Control drag that one. And then just rotate that back the other way. So now they're all just slightly rotated and it just feels a little bit more realistic. Very cool. What are you looking to print? And don't forget the big screws. Never, never. And <laughs> just me, I don't have the patience to work with Z Modeler. I love Z Modeler. It's so much, it's so much fun. Yeah, ZBrush Live is super fun. I love it. It was actually, I, when I first got onto ZBrush Live, I just was like super, uh, super happy to uh, have been a part of it. Um, to like get in there and, and, and be a part of a big community. And again, just a way to give back. So it was, it was, that was also another one of my goals that I was like really excited about. Okay. So at this point, what I want to do is I actually going to turn off smooth and I'm just going to do some dividing to give me some topology. I don't really care too much actually. No, shoot. Oh, I don't want to do that. What do I want to do? I want to give this some resolution. So I just literally changed my mind again. <laughs> this is the theme of today's stream. Ian changes his mind every five seconds because he thinks, don't do it that way, do it that way. That's a lot how my brain works, by the way. My brain is very much, uh, don't do it that way, do it this way. So I'm literally just now just like slapping on some edge loop support. Um, I don't want this edge to collapse here. And again, I'm just gonna make this all one solid piece because we'll be printing this guy. There we go, that's good enough. That's close for what I want. Mm. Okay, hold on one second, hold on one second. Okay, I messed up here. Messed up here because of this right here. So I kind of did myself a really interesting disservice when I approached it like this. All right, I need to fix this. That's fine. We can fix this. Mm, yeah. All right, we'll fix this. Hold on one second. Let's just leave it like such for now. 
I just don't like this shape here. Let's fix this. So this is actually, this is partly why I don't cut into my meshes that much. So I don't know why I chose to go this route. So let's do this. I'm actually going to grab this. We're gonna do some, we're gonna do some R&D stuff here. So let's do this. So I'm going to go to poly groups. We're gonna go group by normals and we're only gonna go on a change greater than 90 degrees. That might have been too much. 65 degrees. No, 65. There we go. Okay. So what we're gonna do now? We're gonna we're gonna end up fixing this. Let's clear this guy off. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and just let me see if I can Q mesh it. This might be an easier way to approach this. I'm gonna flatten this area out. Yep, that works. Yep, that works. That works. That works. Okay, that's fine. All right, that's good for me. Let's go ahead and clip curve this. This is just a nice flat mesh right up here. Boop, that's fine. Okay, so we're just gonna get rid of this section like such. There we go. Okay, that's fine. Oh, did this, oh, why did this break that? Oh, that broke that because I did that. Okay, great, so that's fine. So let's just make that all one piece. So a little weird, it's fine. Um, I'm actually going to cut in on this. I think I'll cut in on this with a boolean instead. Because right now, I just did not do myself a favor with how I prepped this mesh. So a little bit of troubleshooting, but that'll be fine. So we'll change the design a bit, actually. So let's do this. Let's get some, let's get some like interesting shapes here instead and make this look a little cooler. So let's do this. Let's actually grab this guy here. I'm gonna duplicate that mesh. Let's come in, let's do poly groups. Boop, boop, grab that guy, that's perfectly fine. Let's actually auto groups, let's grab that guy, perfect. And then, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Let's do that and then let's go ahead and say, delete hidden. Okay, and then I'm just gonna go ahead, add this all as one poly group. We're gonna key mesh this out. And then let's blow this up. Yeah, there we go. Do something like that. So that's gonna be colliding, that's fine. Okay, and then we're gonna come in here. Let's go ahead and add insert, a multiple elevation. Let's pull this up. Boom, boom, say something like that. Okay, and then we'll take this guy. Let's grab this and this. Okay, that's fine, that works that way. All right, I'll dig it. Ah, dig it. There, that changed the scope of it. That looks a little bit nicer. There we go. Let's give it some buttons. We need some buttons. You can't have, you can't, you can't just have a dial. You need buttons. Let's see here. Don't want to miss the chat too much. Uh, my students would totally benefit from it too. Nice, nice. Uh, ZBrush is a constant growing uh, software and I love seeing its growth. Your story is awesome to hear and I adore your passion for the software community. Oh, thank you. Hey, what's up, Sheriff? How you doing? I was sculpting a female head after zebra meshing and diamond meshing. The ear proportion had uh, uh, is bad and rough topology, making it difficult to add good detail. Where can I fix this? Ooh, awesome. That's a great question. Um, okay. I can, actually, last week I showed a technique, but I'll definitely would love to repeat it. Um, give me one minute, and then I'll answer that question before we wrap up. So let me do something. I just want to add a couple things to this. So first things first is let's just, well, let's do ourselves a favor. Let's grab this guy. Okay, we're gonna go B, I, and T. And we're gonna grab some cylindrical shapes like this. There we go. And actually I'm gonna split this off. So split unmasked. Arrow key down on this guy. We're just gonna go ahead and delete this one. 
So let's go with geometry, modify topology, delete hidden. And the reason why is because I want this to be a little bit wider. So extender. Give us a little bit more of an interesting shape, which would be kind of cool. And then come in here. I don't want creasing, so let's turn off creasing. And then as far as the X resolution, eh, should be fine. It should be fine. Yeah, okay, great. So that sounds good. Fun little button, except that. Except that is fact, control W or polygroup, auto groups, group by normals, I mean. Great, wonderful. So we have something like that. Yeah, nice round button. Okay, and then we're just gonna shrink that down. Control drag, I'm gonna grab at least three of those. I'm just gonna line it up with this arrow. Okay, cool. And then let's actually do one more shape, which is no edge loops. Let's turn off dynamic subdiv. Okay, we'll do something like this real quick. Let's just hollow in here. Let's actually grab that part, invert that. No. Grab that part, invert it, mass this bottom part. I'm gonna bring this up, say something like that. And then let's go ahead, we're just gonna round this button. So we're gonna grab this elevation. There you go, perfect. And then let's just turn this back. Say something like that, there you go. A little bit of a round button. Let's go ahead and just Grab that guy, let's invert it. Okay, and then we're gonna go ahead and add two buttons over here. I'm just kind of playing at this point. Okay, and then what we actually could do, I feel like it needs a lever. I like a little switch, a little switcheroo. So let's do this, let's go back. Let's add a Q cube. Let's drag this in. Okay, something like that. We'll end up modifying this a little bit more, but this will be this will be good enough. This will be fine. And then let's do this. Let's go with. Um, Gonna duplicate this. I'm gonna come in here. Yeah, we'll make this kind of skinny. Boom, boom, boom. We'll drag this in. Yeah, this will be fine. Let's actually come in here. Okay, let's grab this guy. Let's. Split this off. We'll refine this, actually. Um, we'll come through and refine it next week. But let's just go ahead and split. But give us an idea of like, oh, look, that has a switch, some buttons, some thingies, some doodads. So we have at least this with him. So it's like one of those things where it's like, okay, this looks pretty cool for, for now. We can add like a little bit of ventilation system here with some live Boolean tactics. Right, so we can come in, <clears throat> maybe at this point. At this point, actually, we'll take this guy, we'll duplicate it, we'll come in, we'll grab this one, we'll delete hidden. Yeah, there we go, that's cool. Let's kind of get it in, like, actually. Why did I grab? that one just to put it in the middle when I can grab this one and have it in the middle already. So we can do this, so we can drag this out. And here's a cool little trick if you're like, hey, I want like some vents in the back. All right, so let's scale this down like such. And then let's use extender. So I'm just gonna go ahead and extend this out a lot. You can actually repeat this, this phase a few times. So you can do this multiple times 
so you get something that you really are satisfied with. So do the initial one, then come in and do that. Just stretch that out. You can come in here like this. And then let's actually just come in here real quick and then we can add that to then our live Boolean. So it has a little bit of, of cutting factor in it. So, you know, something like this will work out fairly decent for what we're going for. Okay, so now we have this. Let's go ahead and save it. It's a little bit of a while. And now, okay, so you're a sculpting female head. Now let's go ahead. Uh, okay, so um, after Z remeshing, no worries. So after Z remeshing and subdividing, uh, your topology is really bad or it's not good so it's not holding detail which is totally fine that's very common actually so let's do this so um i'm gonna go ahead and just just for funsies we already saved it i think but let's just go ahead and bully in this folder great wonderful yeah great so let's just put that there so we can be like hey we did a thing today awesome great so we have that here we go. Actually, boom. I like the stamp things that I'm working on. Okay, so let's let's pull up this guy. Actually, you want to do that guy? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so let's do this. So let's talk about Dynamesh and well, you okay? Well, you Z remeshed it. Did you Z remesh from Dynamesh? Out of curiosity. Also, hey, what's up, Andre? How you doing? Assuming you dynameshed. So let's do this. I'm gonna just grab this resolution. And you have something like this. Yeah, okay, great, perfect. So you have something like this. You spent all your time sculpting, 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 and then yeah, you Z remesh, and then it's not 100% for you. So um, the first thing to remember too is that resolution with Z remesh obviously is gonna be, you know, you, got, you wanna be able to have like a good low base mesh or, or low poly mesh in order to get what it is you're going for. But you can actually set yourself up for some success in the Z remesher phase. So let's say that you want to Z remesh this and project some details back. Well, if I were to just Z remesh and it's in its current state, you might lose some information. So we have 86,000 active points right now, which is not very high at all. So at this point, if you were to just Z remesh as is, we may or may not get something that's usable. Right, and the flow of topology really matters when you're trying to work within within uh, higher resolutions to hold that detail. So if we were to just zero mesh it, let's see what we get. I feel like it broke it. <laughs> Did you break it? We'll see. It's not even that complex, I'm curious. Come on, you can do it. Come on, can I escape? Oh, I can't escape, okay. Well, for some reason, that was weird. Uh, let's do this here real quick. Let's just make a quick modification. I'm gonna just knife curve. We're just gonna work on the face right now. Let's cut that bad boy right there. Uh, and then let's, let's just try it again. Probably just got hung up somewhere. There we go. Okay. So right now we just kind of threw out a number and it did okay. So my first guess is that, you know, you don't want to go too low. Whenever you're Z remeshing, the thing is, is that let's say if we were to do like one right now at like less than 40,000 points, if I were to do this, I'm going to lose a lot of information. So the first thing is just recognizing that you want to make sure that your topology, there's enough information there for it to be subdivided. This is actually this is actually giving me pretty good results. So let's try to break it. I'm trying to break it. So let's go 0 0.5. Let's see if we can get something a little bit less likely. Okay, so something like this, right, is no good. So even if I were to try to subdivide at this point, go back in time, grab this information here, and then okay. 
Just do that one more time. So that's the first step. First step is how low is something going? And there is a thing called too low. So even if you were to try to fix this, right? You try to bring this up or move this around. If I were to project this information, this is not going to be very well, right? So if I go here and say project history, not everything is going to really adhere. Even if I were to subdivide and try to project history, I'm gonna get a lot of breakage because it's just not enough information. So the first thing is figuring out how much information you actually, like you actually need, right? So the first part, my rule of thumb is anytime you're zebra meshing, what you wanna do is you want to actually go higher and then step down. In this case, it's only 40,000 that I'm trying to get this detail going. Even if I were to step this up and delete, this is 176,000, this isn't too, too bad, but I wanna be able to retain this. So that's the first step. So my golden, my golden rule when it comes to zero measure is to turn on smooth groups and turn it, uh, turn on keep groups and smooth groups down to zero. Okay, that's the first and foremost. And second, adaptive size. The other thing is if you're using adaptive size at, at its default, what it's gonna do is it's, it's trying to figure out the flow of your mesh and how big or small something is. And then it's gonna say, put a big quad in this one spot and put a smaller quad in this other spot. So it's gonna to try to adapt to the way your mesh is actually moving. In this case, it's better to have even topology across the mesh because you're trying to retain the actual details that you that's what you want. So here, if I go adaptive size down to zero, now what's gonna happen is if I were to do something like 10 instead, and then I go ahead and do zero mesh. Now we're gonna see a much different result. So all we did was we took keep groups, move smooth groups down to zero, and then we did adaptive size and we went down to zero. The other thing for smooth groups is that when you divide, when you are subdividing, there is a smoothing element that happens to your mesh. Some people perceive this as it's shrinking. It's not shrinking, it's actually just becoming smooth. And so that in and itself, might have a, a tolerance in which it's just not matching. So it might appear like it's smaller, when in reality it's the same size, it just got smoothed down. So that's why we do keep groups with smooth groups down to zero, even if you only have one poly group, right? So now I can see here that this is 18,000, and now I have my ear information right here. And there's a little bit of breakage, but not too much. But the important part is my flow is going. This might be too low in the initial projection. So a trick that you can do is test it. First go to subtool on subdivision level one and do project history. If you do project history based on that and you get some breaking that happens, like we got a little bit here for some reason, then it may not be enough or the ideal, it might be too low at that point. But then if we subdivide a few more times and then go project history, some of this might be manageable, like it's breaking down here, but everything else, all that detail is going correct and the edge flow is good. So this is one way to approach the uh, getting that detail back. Um, the other way you can do it, and it's a little bit more control, but a little bit more setup as well, which is here, we can actually use, and I showed this last week, we can actually use, um, uh, which I'm gonna call it, poly paints with, uh, with poly group it in order to control the flow of our topology. So I'll demonstrate that one as well. So what we're gonna do here is I'm actually gonna give me some higher resolution. So even if I dynameshed at this point, uh, it's only 39,000. So that's not, that's not very high. So I'm actually gonna increase the resolution and make this a little bit higher so that I have more information for my paint. So now I have a denser mesh. Now what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to grab the paintbrush. We're going to paint, we're going to fill our color with white. So now we have just a white mesh here. And now I'm going to grab paint black. Okay, so I have white first and then I'm going to switch over and now we have black. Now I do want to turn off my tablet for this trick so I don't have pen pressure sensitivity so that I get a nice clean black line. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab I don't want it too thin, but I want it to be thick enough to where there's enough information to be captured. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start drawing some areas in which I want polygroups because I can control my topology better with polygroups. So I'm also gonna turn on stroke, lazy mouse, increase that a bit. 
So here, I, sh I think I showed this last week, but I like this trick. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm just going to start painting. And this will be a way to kind of help control things. I can also, too, maybe come in here and do something like that, just so I have a different poly group. I can even do the give me a mask. All right, so I'll come in here like this. Boom, right? So have something like this. You can get as complicated as you want with this. It's up to you. Um, I usually will do just enough information because I'm going to be using the poly groups to give me some good flow. All right, so let's say I have something like this. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up to Z plugin and I'm going to go to, I docked it over here on the left hand side. I'm going to go to poly group it. I'm going to do polygroup it from paint. So I'm going to go ahead and hit this and we're going to give it a second. Hey, D capitalist, how are you doing? Welcome in, welcome in. Zachary says, pleasure as always, Ian. Have yourself a great day. Thank you for being here so much. You have to head out to Dorkly. Thank you for being here. We're going to be wrapping it up in just a couple minutes. It's the last last trick of the day okay so now i have something like this now this became one piece that's fine just what happened was there's not enough information there for that to uh to actually separate the poly paint so that means i would need a thicker or bolder line this is fine for this demonstration it's just when this happens just come in here and be like oh it's probably something right about here i probably needed it maybe this right here was like not complete if there's like a little space you're not always going to get, uh, you know, not always going to get the, the the poly group separation. So we'll do that one more time. All right, there we go. So now we have that separation, which is perfect. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to store my history. This is the state in which my mesh looks really good. So I'm going to store that information by hitting Control and tapping up here. So I have that. Okay, and now I want to clean up all this jaggedness that's happening. This is not good this is like this is not good it's really bad right it's really jaggy and it's not looking good so we want to fix this so that's okay easiest way to start this is go to deformation and polish by groups and as soon as we do that we get a nice clean smooth that factor that's happening you can also do this manually by coming up here to the light box by hitting the comic key go to brush go to smooth which is over here and then you can do smooth groups. And then you can say, I'm gonna smooth this. Now I'm gonna turn off paint and I'm just going to start refining a lot of this. And the, the smoother your groups are, the better. Okay, say something like that. Okay, and we'll just, again, you're just kind of coming in and cleaning this up, smoothing this all out, making it so that the lines are nice and even as much as possible. There we go. So say something like that. So now what we have here is groups that are a little bit clean and able to control the mesh a bit. So now we're gonna use the store advantage. We're gonna come over here. Again, we've, we've gone ahead and we have history with all of our detail. And then we're gonna to go to, mod to Z remesher. And then the same tricks I've told you with the other stuff. We're gonna do adaptive size, Adaptive size down to zero, but turn adapt on. Pick a resolution that makes sense. It's 341,000 active points, so maybe something like 10, maybe even a little higher than this, maybe 15 would be good. And the smooth groups, keep groups down to zero. So now I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's see remesh this. And of course I have symmetry turned on, so that's going to do the, the symmetrical aspect of it. And we'll give it a second. And now here, let's go ahead and switch to our white paint here. You can see now that we at least have different poly groups that are coming through and helping keeping the edge flow as we want it. And now this is pretty low, this is 25,000, so that's, that's not too bad. So now I can subdivide a few times and then I can go up to subtool and I can say, hey, let's go ahead and project history get that detail back on there. We had the poly paint that came back. We didn't need to do that. So we could have turned off the color if we wanted to. So go back over here, color, and then let's go ahead and just project history. 
and now that detail will come back. So that's another way in which you do it. It's not always perfect, so you may have to go in and fix a few things. Like in this case, we're getting some breakage down here, but also this is a tricky edge. This edge right here, because I cut it so weird, is not 100% ideal, so it doesn't hurt to step down, do a little bit of a cleanup. If your face is truly symmetrical, like your face is 100% symmetrical like this one, and you don't really need to come in and do this type of fix, the easiest way to do that I'm sorry, or you need to do that type of fix, is just mirror and weld it. Just go ahead and delete your lower topology for a second. And you can just mirror and weld that, um, which then you may want to like, um, you may have to then reconstruct your subdivisions. And there you go. And then you can step back down and step back up. You have subdivisions, you have cleaner mesh, and your face is completely mirrored. So that's another way that you can go about doing it. That was a little bit more of a process, but at the end of the day, that's gonna help you with that. You can also correct some of your topology if you want to have edge flow that's flowing in a way that makes the most sense. Like you do a Z remesh, like for example, we did a Z remesh here as for instance, and let's say we wanted this, we needed this to kind of flow a little bit more. Don't forget we have uh, Z remesher guides. And what you can do with this is you could say, look, I really need the edge flow to flow like this. Actually, it's paint on the on screen left. So I need the edge flow to flow in this direction. And so you don't want to put too many of these, right? Because then you can confuse the remesher. But you can say, I need this to be a little bit more looped. And then you can come through here to Z remesher and increase the curve strength. And then say same and then Z remesh that. And now it's going to take that curve into account and help initiate that but now we're just now we're, i'm just kind of like destroying it at this point so that's another way you can go about doing that all right you know what remaining light i do not have that answer yet <laughs> i'm so sorry um but uh do me a favor uh send me a dm message um if you're on discord send me a dm on that um and then i will get to that i apologize i dropped the ball on that one i meant to ask about it and then i had a hundred other things pop up and then i forgot and that's the real answer so i'm so sorry so here do me a favor uh if you're not part of my discord please jump in there um jump in there do that and then send me a dm and then I will, I will find the answer to that question. So, okay guys, that's gonna be it for today. We are at one o'clock, three hour stream. We did a lot, which is cool. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the stream. Thank you guys so much for being a part of it. It's always super awesome that uh, I get to come in here, hang out, do some cool stuff, talk about awesome things. And of course too, we get to make fun characters such as this guy here. Boop, there he is. There he is in all his glory. All right, so we still have a lot more work to do on that. Um, I might be working on him a little bit more just on the background because I do want to move on to some next steps, but it's always cool to see the fun build. So cool, cool, cool. Awesome. Thank you, Remaining Light. All right, everybody, that is it. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you next week. And as always, be safe out there. All right, talk to you guys later. Bye, 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 bye.